next item. Your Worship, uh, item three on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. There are two additions. 16.1 would be a WebEx agreement, a staff report. And 17.1 is a committee of the whole recommendation with respect to sustaining St. John Transit and Parking. Okay, thank you. I'll move the agenda as amended. Okay, thank you. Moved by the deputy, second by Councillor Sullivan. Thank you. Just pause for a moment, please. Uh, I've just uh, been sent a note that there's no sound, Mr. Evans, on the live feed. So I don't know if you can just look into that, please. Uh, uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we're in a we're in a live world, live world, live feed. So okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Okay, great. The agenda then. That motion is on the floor. I'll call that question. All those in favor? Thank you. And anyone contrary minded? Okay, thank you. Not. Not, uh, not seeing anyone, that is a unanimous vote as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, next item, please. Item four, Your Worship, disclosures of conflict of interest. Okay, just by a show of hands, if anyone has a conflict of interest. Okay, not, not seeing any. Thank you. Motion, uh, sorry, next item. Uh, next item is the consent agenda. Okay. I'd move 5.1 to 5.12. Okay, thank you. Moved and uh, second. Thank you. No Sorry. second. Moved by the deputy, seconded by Councillor Sullivan. Thank you. Just uh, thanks for all the hands. Uh, and I, uh, there may be a couple of questions. Just one second. I would, uh, folks, just ask, um, I would ask uh, if no one else has got the same thought, I would love to hear from um, uh, Commissioner Hamilton on 5.12, uh, just in terms of what the plan there. There is, which is virtual planning advisory committee and heritage development board service restoration uh, and public hearing. So I would love the commissioner to speak to that. And then I saw a couple of other hands. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Armstrong. Just let me get those. Councillor Armstrong, uh, Sullivan, the deputy mayor, and Councillor Reardon. Okay, thank you. Councillor Armstrong, I'll go to you first, please. Yes, I Yes, I just want to speak on the uh, 5.1 in the asphalt contract if it passes through. It's another great year for competition in the city of St. John. Where we saved last year, we saved over a million. And again, this year, we have saved over a million dollars in contracting out for the asphalt. So that's another million dollars we have to work with, with how we will in these bad times. So I want to congratulate staff and thank you for the uh, all the asphalt competitors that bid hard. And uh, it's a good process for the city of St. John when we save $1 million on one okay, item. Thank you, sir. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, a question on 5-7. First, a, a thanks to um, city staff, Mr. Fogan, and certainly the port uh, for continuing to work on this as it ran through several obstacles. Um, I guess the one piece that I might have missed in the report, um, Mr. Fogan, was just a day to plan date of this work to be done uh through your worship to the councillor the uh it's the award of the tender so we'll look to uh, get that done uh actually get the award uh this week uh out to the successful bidder and it uh, would start within the next week or two excellent thanks okay perfect thank you thank you mr fogan and uh, deputy mayor you had a question or comment uh yes thank you worship uh, i just wanted to know on 5.1 and 5.2, uh, especially in 5.1, where some of that work will be done by our staff. So would that happen like, uh, like it's now going to be considered essential work, like the paving, will that start or do we have to wait for a certain time? Uh, I just wondered if there was um, any timing on that because some of the uh, um, maintenance work for paving is done by our staff. So will they be allowed to do it um, uh, at right, right away or will we have to wait? Okay, thank you relative to the current conditions. Okay, 19, okay. yes. Yep, thank you. Commissioner Hugenholtz or city manager, um, call on one of the two. Commissioner, please. Okay, Commissioner Hugenholtz. Yes, good evening, Your Worship. Uh, through you to uh, the deputy mayor. Uh, currently, under our essential services mode, we are uh, doing a limited amount of pothole patching. 
Uh, we are working through a process to look at uh, restarting uh, some programs, although the resumption of, uh, of some work, <coughs> like the uh, asphalt overlay program, uh, we're not sure at what point we're going to be able to restart that. Uh, now, our, it's important to note that our main resurfacing program, uh, that work is done through a contract, and that's uh, largely unaffected by uh, the current restrictions. Yes, I'm so while while at, at the present time we may be on a, a bit of a more of a, a limited uh, scope of work, uh, we expect to be ramping that up over the next uh, few weeks and months. Okay, uh, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Reardon, did I have you? Did you have a comment? You do. You do. Thank thank you, Worship. Um, this whole this so there's a lot on this that I have a lot of questions about, but. 5.1 opens with the statement that asphalt maintenance, surface repairs, and new road construction are primary concerns of citizens and a priority of common council. And this is no reflection on the author, but our roads have been empty for the last month, and I don't know if we'll ever use them again like we have as we get used to working from home, working virtually, and as we reevaluate cleaner air and we and we walk more and we do those sorts of things. So. I have some problems going forward with this, some of these, and I, I've struggled with this all weekend. So on 5.2, I've got asphalt resurfacing, a $6 million uh, budget right here, or, or I should say a seven. That That is uh, over a million, $1.3 million differential on the engineering estimate. I, I'm curious about that. And the other thing is that it says that staff believe that the company would have the resources and the expertise to deliver uh, the to deliver what we want. But I guess when I look at that, I say, can they deliver your product and your quality and all in the time frame you want? So yeah, they do have the resources and the expertise, but can they actually deliver the product? And I would ask that about any of these as we go forward on this. Um, so I would ask about the engineering estimate on that one. Uh, most of the engineering estimates are quite a bit off um, in the in the uh, consent agenda. Five on five point three. I was Thanks, curious. Can we, can we just uh, do, can we deal with? Two then. Yeah, can we just stay in that one just for a moment, sure. uh, Commissioner? Would you like to? Can you tackle that one for us, please? Certainly, uh, through you, Your Worship, to uh, Councillor Reardon. Um, yeah, we were. There's a, a lot of factors that go into the tenant prices that we receive. Everything from uh, how much work contractors have on the go, uh, material prices, uh, competition. Uh, there are a lot of factors. We we've we are fortunate with this contract that it has come in significantly under budget. Um, it would be really impossible to point that towards one factor or another. Um, so it's it's hard to say where that exactly comes from. Uh, our estimates are based on sort of historical plus what we see uh, for future pricing. Uh, as to your question about the contractor being able to deliver on this scope of work, uh, yeah, under the current situation, we don't have any uh, concerns at this point in time about the contractor's ability to deliver on this scope of work. I just noticed that that is a, it's just a phrase that's repeated over in a lot of the contracts that, you know, staff believes that they have the resources and the expertise. But I guess I ask myself, can all this stuff be delivered? I mean, that's quite a differential on that one. On 5-3, I noticed that 5-2, you had um, several tenders on that, uh, or several responses, I guess. But on 5-3, who's going to, the, the um, award will go to Classic for 5-2, but they didn't. They didn't um, bid on supplying asphalt. Do they subcontract to get their asphalt, or do they have their own asphalt? I don't believe co uh, classic construction has ever bid on the uh, material supply, although okay. they are uh, uh, always a competitor for our uh, asphalt resurfacing program. I was just surprised where they, you know, would bid on all the work, but then didn't bid on that component. Both uh, both tenders closed on April 7th. All right. I think that's, uh, 
I think that's it for that one. I'm going to move on to 5-4. I am curious about property attributes. What information is that? It tells me in my kit what they're going to use it for, but I don't know. Um, I don't know what it is you're collecting or what you have access to. Ms. Stephanie Rackley Roach will take that, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rackley Roach. Uh, through you, Your Worship, it's an exchange of information back and forth between the province and the city. And um, each month, the uh, province updates all their property information and had been providing that to the city. And in return, we provide anything that um, we've updated in our um, geospatial database. So, Stephanie, what sort of information would that be? I'm just curious because I noticed that, you know, we talked about that it used for growth and used for different other things, what the information would be used for. But I'm just curious as to what those attributes actually might be that you're seeking. So, so, uh, so things such as the sale of buildings, um, changes in property lines, assessment values, that type of thing from the province. Okay, thanks so much. That's it for me, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, did I miss anyone else, Council, on the consent agenda? Okay, I'll call that question then. I'll call the question. All those in favor, please show a, a hand. Okay, thank you. And anyone contrary minded? Okay, not seeing or hearing anyone. That's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, next item, Common Clerk. Your Worship, next item is members' comments. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sullivan, first up. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a quick shout out for the folks at the Cherrybrook Zoo who continue to uh, do their own virtual tours of the Cherrybrook Zoo every morning at 10.30. So you can find that on their Facebook site. Uh, and just for everybody, stay home and stay safe. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hickey. Thank you very briefly, Your Worship. Uh, I certainly echo your comments. Uh, as all of our hearts are truly in Nova Scotia this week uh, and uh, moving forward on the really tragic situation that happened here and certainly one that impacts us even closer to home with uh, the loss of uh, Chris Pam Sis native as well and uh, Lisa McCauley who was one of the victims. Uh, and certainly you know moving forward hopefully we certainly had a nod from the federal government today and the prime minister in that uh, the movement of uh, further bans and uh, increases in gun legislation, which is extremely positive moving forward. So thanks. And also a recognition of National Volunteer Week. This week. So thanks to anyone who volunteers out there. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Councillor Armstrong. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Councillor. And I see you, Councillor Reardon. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Armstrong. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Stephen and Victor Train, who became good corporate neighbors as they cleaned up the whole St. James and Ross Street yesterday in the corner lot that the city tore down a couple months ago. If more citizens could be like that, it'd be great to clean up all our streets. Uh, I think I think it's just a fantastic thing. And I'm sure more citizens will kick in to help out cleaning up the streets. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Reardon. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to uh, say to everyone that with going through COVID to please stay safe and to be smart. Uh, that isn't over yet. We still have uh, we still have a little way to go. And I'll just give you a little bit of old fashioned wisdom from uh, my father who went to heaven in 2001, but he was a guy who was fanatic about the kitchen sink. Nothing was allowed in that sink but dishes or a dishcloth. So uh, no baby washing, no hair washing, no hand washing. My kids have for years thought it was crazy because I don't want their book bags on my kitchen table or a purse on my table. I'm not, I don't believe I'm a germ germaphobe. It's just that I grew up in an era when you got sick, the doctor came to your house with a needle that had an antibiotic in it and it was not a banana flavored medicine that was pleasant to take. So I think my generation is a little bit scared about staying clean and being cautious. So I just extend that message to everyone to still stay on your guard with this. Um, keep washing those hands. That's when our longevity changed as a race of humans is when we discovered that if we wash our hands, that uh, it changed our health. And uh, prior to understanding what germs and microbiology are, and I think everyone that works in a hospital or anyone that works, um, uh, even as an administrator should have a microbiology course if you're working in a hospital. 
And uh, so anyway, so that's all I have to say about that. But please stay safe and be cautious and continue on this trip. And um, we will hopefully get to the end very shortly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor McKenzie and then a CU deputy. Yep, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I echo the remarks about uh, what happened in Nova Scotia and, uh, and my heart goes out to those victim families. Um, I want to say thank you to um, a leader in the North End who will be uh, moving on to another, uh, another venture. Barry Galloway, who is the executive director of uh, One Change and operates the Nick Nicole Center for us, uh, is moving on. And uh, he's been with us for five years. He's uh, implemented a lot of good programming. Uh, right now, they are feeding kids every day uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. And so, uh, you know, we're going to miss him. And I uh, wish him well, wish him well in his uh, future ventures. Thank you, Richard. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Well, thank you, Worship. I just wanted to say, uh, I guess on behalf of all of us, and I know you've expressed it many times, uh, thank you to our health care workers and everyone in the community, the ones that are out with at the food banks and, and our taxi drivers and our bus drivers and our own staff that are out there working. I mean, if we didn't have all those people working in the community in our city here, I mean, many people would have such a difficult time. So there's just so many people out there that are volunteering their time. They're risking their lives in some way that they're helping others. So this is the time that we have to say thank you to them because so many people depend on them. So I just want to give a big shout out to all the people that are supporting everybody else in this community. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, deputy. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. I just um, I just wanted to make a couple, couple of quick comments. First of all, I've been involved in a in a what I'd call a community movement along with uh, other leaders around uh, uh, Greater St. John. All of the communities involved in um, having a community conversation that's been dubbed "Rise Up St. John," which is really uh, a, a group of uh, leaders coming together to talk about uh, what could be a new normal. That's we're hearing a little bit of discussion about what a new normal looks like. I truly believe it's a uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to design and implement a new path forward. It's very early days, but uh, really been encouraged by folks from all over the province coming together to talk about uh, what uh, economic, social and cultural recovery could look like working with Chambers, Economic Development, Greater St. John, Develop St. John, you know, all of the, the folks we would all know, the economic development agencies, the social agencies to talk about uh, how do we uh, work together more collaboratively than we ever have. And some of the innovative ideas and solutions that have been put on the table already in just uh, four or five conversations have been absolutely incredible. And we'll certainly uh, uh, be linking back together with uh, all of the communities uh, over the weeks and months to come. And the whole idea here is how do we uh, recover socially, economically, and culturally uh, through COVID-19 and, and have an even better path uh, forward, but one we're designing and moving forward together. So um, I'm looking forward to, to those continued discussions. Okay, and I don't see any other hands, but guess what I did is I forgot. So with your indulgence, I had asked Commissioner Hamilton to give us a very quick overview on 512 and then went right by it. So Commissioner Hamilton, can I just call on you to, to give us a very quick overview of uh, what we're doing to, uh, to bring those services to a uh, virtual or digital world? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, good evening, Your Worship, members of Council. I'm pleased to introduce recommendations this evening to reactivate Council's planning and, and heritage application processes. This includes meetings of the Planning Advisory Committee, your Heritage Board, and uh, public hearings at Council. Um, the recommendations before you this evening will see the, the rescheduling of public hearings for dates on June 8th and 15th for the planning applications that are currently in the queue. Building on the successful launch of the virtual one-stop development shop, which happened uh, last month, this signals the City of St. John is open for business and is continuing efforts to support growth in our community. This process will enable virtual meetings, allowing the public to participate either through web conference or by phone to ensure continued public access for public hearings and committee meetings. 
Communications will be rolled out this week, advising the public and our clients how they can actively engage in this process. And city staff are available to support the public in navigating this process and can be reached through email at our one-stop development shop at onestop at stjohn.ca or through phone at 658-2911. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay. Well, no, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hamilton, to your uh, your team. You've been very, very quickly uh, um, responding to the needs to uh, digitize and get online, and uh, that's a great example. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor McKenzie, a comment? Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you, Jack. And I'm just wondering, uh, do we have a backlog we have to work through because of the, uh, the time off, uh, or are we going to be on connect? Yes, Your Worship, there is a, a backlog of applications, and that's the reason why we've scheduled two hearing dates in June, on June 8th and 15th, to deal with that backlog. So we should be back on track by June 15th? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And Your Worship, if I may, uh, through you to the Councillor, that also means that one of those meetings is on an off Monday and will be scheduled accordingly. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, folks. Next item, come clerk. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, 7.1 on your agenda is a proclamation, and it's for Lyme Awareness Month, May 2020. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so the proclamation reads, whereas Lyme disease is one of the fastest growing infections in Canada, and whereas the population of ticks, the prime cause of Lyme disease, is growing and expanding in New Brunswick, and... Whereas the tick season is also extended due to climate change, and whereas there is an increasing number of New Brunswickers who are suffering from Lyme disease, and whereas Lyme disease, if not diagnosed and treated early, can become a debilitating condition causing extreme fatigue, cardiac and nervous system disorders, and or arthritic symptoms, and whereas all all New Brunswickers would benefit by being more aware of Lyme disease, how it is contracted, what the symptoms associated with Lyme disease are, and how to get prompt medical care needed to avoid illness and suffering. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Don Darling of St. John, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2020 as Lyme Awareness Month in the city of St. John. Thank you. Next item. Uh, Your Worship, one more proclamation, 7.2 on your agenda, and this is day of mourning, April 28th. Okay, thank you. And um, I would note from my memory, I b believe typically, uh, not I believe, I know we gather uh, typically at the memorial at Lily Lake. Of course, uh, in these times, uh, we're, we're not going to be gathering, uh, certainly in the same way. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there's going to be a virtual gathering or what might happen, but uh, certainly very fitting, especially in light again of the, the tragic events of the last few days. The proclamation reads, whereas... Every year, nearly 1,000 Canadian workers are killed by workplace injuries and many more die from occupational disease. And whereas, thousands more are permanently disabled. And whereas, tens of thousands are injured or made ill. And whereas, concerned Canadians are determined to prevent these tragedies by observing April 28th as a day of mourning to remember these victims of workplace injuries and disease. Secondly, renewing our efforts to seek stronger safety and health protections better standards and enforcement and fair and just compensations and redirecting, rededicating, excuse me, ourselves to improving safety and health in every Canadian workplace. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Don Darling of St. John, do hereby proclaim April 28, 2020 as a day of mourning and recognition of workers killed, injured, or disabled on the job. Thank you, Common Clerk. Next item. Your Worship, item 12.1 on your agenda is a staff report, essential services update. Okay, thank you. City Manager, I'll turn that to you, please. Uh, your Worship, members of Council, good evening. Uh, to begin this presentation, just I just need to pause for a moment and share my screen with you. Your Worship, members of Council, this presentation this evening is designed to uh, inform the public 
about our current essential services model, how and why we adopted it, and where we are going from here. By way of background, on the 17th of March, following some very specific guidance from the Chief Medical Officer of Health and also from our medic federal medical authorities, we determined that the best way to satisfy their direction was through the, the adoption of a essential services model. In short, only do what needed to be done. And that direction was provided through our emergency management organization to the entire city construct uh, since we are already in an emergency response mode. On the 19th of March, there was a provincial state of emergency declared and mandatory orders were subsequently issued. Overall, the key messaging from our health authorities, from the Premier and the Prime Minister is shown on this slide. In short, stay home whenever possible, including working from home. Only go out when necessary and minimize the stops when you do. Perhaps the most important two aspects, maintain physical distancing of two meters and no gatherings. <coughs> Self-monitor and self-isolate as appropriate and use protective equipment, personal protective equipment when necessary, but don't waste it. And certainly do not use medical grade equipment unless you are in the medical profession. That overall summary of direction uh, was further reinforced by WorkSafe New Brunswick providing a complementary direction for all workers within the province. There are several reasons why we adopted the essential services model. First of all, it certainly does facilitate us following the guidance from the Chief Medical Officer of Health as it facilitates us following the mandatory orders from the province. It does help protect our own workforce, but it also ensures the health and safety of our community by making sure that we focus on the essential services that our community needs, such as the provision of safe, clean drinking water. The final reason for the essential services model is important and became increasingly important as we came to the realization that we would be in the COVID-19 pandemic and the provincial state of emergency for a prolonged period of time. And that was to reduce costs or our expenses in a time when our revenues have been very much reduced. In addition to the essential services model, which helped control costs, we also took or undertook other measures to also help in controlling those costs. And these will be described in further detail by our chief financial officer in the next presentation. But in short, by slamming on the brakes for all of our spending, it permitted us or permits us to be in a better situation financially, because there is no doubt that we are losing revenue daily. Our initial list of essential services that we established on the 17th of March is shown on this slide. I do not propose to go through these in any detail whatsoever, but they are the list of those things that we thought were important in order to achieve the reasons for which the essential services was declared. Our essential services list has evolved. First of all, it has evolved because the mandatory orders have changed. And most recently, in fact, last Thursday, the mandatory order was modified whereby the requirement to only execute critical functions only was removed from the mandatory order. Also, additional clarification has been provided through the series of mandatory orders and follow on directives from the province that construction activity is in fact permitted. Therefore, the approach that we have taken in terms of evolving our essential services is the, to answer the question, what could be restored, but yet still satisfy the mandatory orders, medical direction and guidance, and work safe New Brunswick formal direction. We created a service restoration team in order to work through all of those questions and to work through which services could in fact be restored. We need to respect the points I've also mentioned. Uh, sorry, we need to respect the points that I have already mentioned, but we also need to carefully consider the costs of restoring a service and 
what that does to our other priorities in terms of the services that we already deliver. For example, one of the evolutions we made in our essential services is now all development activity, including, as you just heard, public hearings and PACs, are, have now been restored, reinstated, provided that that development activity relates directly to construction activity. And other services are now under consideration. I'll provide a list of that in a moment. The changes to the mandatory order on 17 April 2020, last Thursday, are noteworthy in that the critical functions only requirement has been eliminated. Therefore, the city staff felt it was important to develop a list of criteria for what an essential service actually was. The details are shown here. I do not need to go through it in detail for the purposes of this presentation, but safe to say it's respect all the health and safety guidelines, protect our assets, and make sure that financially we are well positioned moving forward. This slide shows the additional services that are currently under consideration. This slide is not in any priority sequence. One of the activities or one of the services on this slide is already underway, began today, and that is our street sweeping service. The remainder of these items are going through the process to ensure we can respect the health and safety requirements, to ensure that we can respect the mandatory orders, and to ensure that we keep our costs under control in a financially challenging time. As each of those, these services satisfy those requirements, we will reinstate them because our ultimate goal is to provide as many services as possible and also to get our entire workforce back to work. To be clear, we are not returning to normal services. We are remaining in an essential services model in order to protect that vital health and safety and also to control costs. This concludes the briefing this evening. We are simply seeking endorsement from council of the essential services model as described within this briefing. Your worship subject to questions, that concludes the presentation this evening. Okay, thank you, city manager. You'll stop sharing so I can see folks if they'd like to. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay, thank you, deputy mayor. I just want to um, say uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased that the street uh, sweeping has begun and I think uh, many citizens in the city will be very happy about that. And I wondered, um, with that, I don't want to ask for too much, but like, for instance, uptown King Square, will there be any cleaning of any of the squares or the parks, the ones that are very prominent in the city? I wonder if that is being considered at all. Uh, your Worship, through you to the Deputy Mayor, yes. Uh, I know I went through the list very quickly on that slide, but you'll find on that slide public spaces uh, post-winter cleanup. And that is one of the items that we are taking a look at. Again, assuming we can do it safely, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I think, uh, thank you very much for doing that. I know that we talked about it at the growth committee and I also know it was talked about at the finance committee, but I think we're all happy that that will happen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Worship. Uh, City Manager, I'm, I'm assuming that street sweeping is including sidewalk cleaning as well. Uh, Your Worship, through you to the Councillor, yes, sidewalk sweeping will actually take a few more days before it starts. There's some equipment issues, maintenance, etc. that need to occur, but it is our intention to uh, sidewalk sweep as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hickey. Thanks, Your Worship. That was my question, but certainly echo what uh, both councillors have said, and I've heard the importance of street sweeping and making, especially with key, in keeping our parks open, uh, making sure they're clean and accessible for everyone and getting the sand and grit off them uh, uh, is important after the winter months. So echo support of that one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Norton, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to the city manager. Uh, thank you, uh, city manager, for that. And uh, getting street sweeping off off the ground, I guess, in a time when everyone's cleaning their workplaces and their and their homes and uh, and their businesses, um, now's an opportune time for us to uh, to do the same. So, I uh, appreciate uh, us getting uh, getting the the big sweepers out and the big dustpans. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you again, City Manager, for uh, turning that conversation around very quickly from you know last week to today. Uh, working with the province to 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 seek you know more clarity and what we uh, we can do, obviously doing safely. So thank you for that. And I just want to acknowledge. I think I can't remember who Councillor Armstrong. I think. Um, made made uh, reference to citizens who are, uh, you know, probably with a bit of uh, pent up energy. Uh, I can give you two examples. I live in the uptown now um, on my daily dog dog walk uh, all the way down through Germain Street. Uh, I've met people who have just uh, taken it upon themselves to uh, clean up the you know, the, uh, the sidewalks and rake and clean up. I know, uh, a neighbor of mine, uh, uh, swept up and picked up, a uh, a bunch of debris in an alleyway. We know uptown St. John has done some work as well to try and work through. So this, so I, many, what is it? Uh, many hands make light work. So, uh, glad to see us um, coming together with that as well. Thank you, city manager. Back to you. Uh, your worship, just on your comment and other people's comments about, uh, citizens chipping in, residents chipping in, could not agree more that it's a, a tremendous plus and indicative of the character of this city. However, I would be remiss if I didn't remind those individuals who are volunteering to do that work that there are still very much very specific guidelines from the Chief Medical Officer of Health on distancing, no gatherings, etc., cetera, and no shared equipment uh, that need, need to be followed by those outstanding volunteers. Yep. Sorry, I, I should have met, I should have referenced the same thing, City Manager. That was my understanding as well. So, and I'll move okay. the recommendation. Thank you. Okay, moved and seconded by Councillor McKenzie. Thank you. On the question, all those in favor? Thank you. And anyone contrary minded? Not seeing or hearing anyone. A motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item, Common Clerk. Your Worship, item 12.2 on your agenda is an operations update. Okay, thank you. Back to you, City Manager. Uh, your Worship, members of uh, Council. The news within New Brunswick has indeed been positive uh, during the last week in terms of the number of COVID-19 cases. However, clearly the pandemic and the associated emergency is not over, and certainly there will be lingering effects even as we continue to see very, new, very low numbers of new cases. Therefore, as we have done for the past two council meetings, uh, our intent this evening is to provide you an updated uh, operations brief. It will be relatively short this evening. Uh, in order to keep you fully aware on our efforts towards COVID-19 from an operational perspective. Our incident commander at our emergency operations center remains our fire chief, uh, Chief Kevin Clifford. This evening, however, the presentation will be uh, bookend by our two deputy fire chiefs, who also on occasion act as incident commanders. And I would like to first of all, introduce Deputy Fire Chief Rob Nickel, to give the introduction and Deputy Fire Chief Mike Clark will be, give the uh, concluding remarks before handing it back to me. Deputy Nickel, over to you. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. This is the third EOC update to Council on the COVID-19 situation and we will follow a similar format as the previous updates. Members of the command and general staff will give a brief update from their respective areas to give you a sense of how the city is responding and adapting to the COVID-19 crisis. Since last update, the St. John EMO has remained at partial activation in response to this pandemic. It will remain at partial activation or enhanced monitoring as the province recently renewed the state of emergency for another 14 days on April 16th. Current confirmed COVID numbers show over 2.4 million cases globally, 35,000 cases in Canada, 118 cases in the province of New Brunswick, of which 26 are, were in the St. John region. We continue to follow the directives of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Russell, and the Provincial Pandemic Task Force as we navigate this COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, we are seeing encouraging trends in the province of New Brunswick. At this time, there have been no deaths in New Brunswick related to COVID-19, and latest numbers uh, sent out today show only 20 active cases in the province. It is, however, essential that we all continue to follow the restrictions of the state of emergency to ensure that the encouraging trends will continue. The EOC objectives have been modified since the last update and now include implementing service restoration plans and planning for a potential flood response should we reach the flood stage triggers. The current objectives are as follows. Objective number one, 
implement all necessary measures to ensure the safety of the citizens and the employees of the City of St. John, as directed by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Number two, ensure critical services are maintained, including public safety services and critical infrastructure. Three, provide systematic updates to the public, staff, senior leadership, and St. John EMO stakeholders on verified information pertaining to the city's response to this pandemic. Four, implement and review the plan to restore those city services that can be safely reinstated while respecting all the direction provided by the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And finally, objective five is to monitor Riverwatch 2020 projections and prepare to stand up the flood response resources as required. That's the end of my briefing. I will now turn it over to the liaison officer, Josh Hennessy. Good evening, your worship and members of council. As the liaison officer, I am responsible for coordinating all external agencies with St. John EMO. Since our last briefing, several updates have occurred within the liaison role. As a collaborative effort, several sites were explored to facilitate the increased demand for the Greater St. John Emergency Food Program as a result of COVID-19. This program is now serving approximately 105 households and required a larger facility for tractor trailer deliveries of food and a larger space to respect physical distancing of volunteers. Upon exploring several sites, which included schools, churches, arenas, the, the Diamond Jubilee Cruise term Terminal was determined the most appropriate site and is currently operational. St. John EMO explored several options for temporary bridge solutions to service the Randolph area pending potential flooding for this year. NBMO, the military and private contractors were all contacted. However, it was best determined that St. John EMO will service th that particular area with the same means as years past, based on solution availability and overall cost. NBMO, the Office of the Fire Marshal and the Provincial Police Services Unit are currently fielding requests for items related to COVID, in particular PPE. To date, we have received PP items such as masks and face shields to assist in, the equi in, in equipping our staff. Public Health opened up a second fully operational assessment site at 84 Rope, Rope Walk Road in addition to the Loch Lomond site. These two sites will serve all of Regional Health Authority Zone 2. In addition, Public Health last week announced that they are now able to use rapid field test kits which are used, which are for use outside of those two site locations. The rapid field test kits have a turnaround time of approximately 45 minutes and usage is based on direction through the 811 number. Information sharing is vitally important to managing this event and as information flows to the liaison officer, it is distributed through St. John EMO and the city's senior leadership team. This ensures that all members are informed with the most up-to-date information available. That concludes the liaison brief for this evening. Up next, it is my pleasure to introduce our information officer, Lisa Casey. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. My update for you this evening is brief. Our communication strategy continues to focus on providing accurate and timely information to the community through our website and social media channels. This includes our own municipal updates, as well as information from the province and public health officials. We have a number of links available on our website to direct people to official resources that are both helpful and of interest. We're handling media inquiries daily and as required, and we thank members of the media for the efforts they have made to reach out to us for official updates and for the accuracy of their reporting. Internal communication with our workforce continues to be a priority as well, and we've maintained regular communication with employees through all available mediums. We very much appreciate the efforts you as a council and as mayor and individual councillors have made to communicate with the public through the sharing of verified information. We remain well positioned to deliver on our priorities and support our community. This concludes my brief. I'll now introduce Stephanie Hossack as the Operations Section Chief. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. 
This evening, I will update you on the progress of our safety and operations teams over the last two weeks. Our safety efforts have centered upon two initiatives aimed at slowing the spread of COVID-19 and contributing to the global effort to flatten the curve. First, I will be discussing the wearing of face masks, and secondly, the establishment of COVID-19 employee screening stations. We have been closely monitoring the advice of New Brunswick and Canadian public health authorities, as well as the Centers for Disease Control for guidance and direction as their understanding of this threat to public health continues to evolve. The emerging consensus is that health and safety are best served by wearing masks in public where maintaining physical distancing cannot be assured. In this regard, we are particularly concerned about our frontline operational employees who cannot always travel alone in work vehicles and who often work in teams on the job site. Accordingly, we have implemented a program supported by personal protective equipment requiring employees to wear masks whenever two meters of separation from others cannot be guaranteed. We have adopted further precautions as well, building on the best practices research of our safety team and are in the process of installing barriers to crew vehicles to provide additional protection. Our second accomplishment in safety has been the establishment of COVID-19 employee screening at our facilities. This conforms with WorkSafe New Brunswick's latest direction that employers have to process for, uh, have a process in place for carrying out symptom checks. Further, the revised province of New Brunswick state of emergency mandates employers to take every reasonable step required to prevent persons who exhibit symptoms of COVID-19 from entering the workplace. In addition, the St. John EMO operations section has moved forward with its vital community service role in a number of ways, which include maintaining critical water and transportation infrastructures, providing an effective public safety response, maintaining public transit services, fares have now been restored while protecting drivers, maintaining critical support services, including IT and payroll, providing our employees with the most up-to-date COVID-19 information, continuing to connect our employees with support resources, as well as a service restoration plan, which has been developed and is now in the implementation phase. Actions taken by our citizens to follow the advice of public health, to social distance, and to stay home when possible has been a great demonstration of people uniting while distance for the good of our community. This commitment has allowed us to keep our parks open, which has not been possible in all communities. We feel this is critical for mental and physical health, and we thank you. In closing, I would like to thank the employees of the City of St. John, St. John Transit, and the St. John Police Force for their dedication during this difficult time. I would like to express our gratitude to the employees who come to work and to those who are working from home, who have faced and overcome challenges, and who continue to serve our citizens and keep our city functioning. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Logistics Section Chief Dan LeBlanc. Thank you, Stephanie. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Common Council. Similar to the update two weeks ago, the Logistics Section has activated four of its six units. Again, for expediency, I'll only provide updates on the two most active units. The Communications Unit has worked through all immediate demands for IT services, phones, uh, remote connectivity, and has established a good pace for supporting St. John EMO and municipal staff working remotely. Since the COVID-19 pandemic activation, the Supply Unit has facilitated 42 requests, of which 26 have been completed, 10 remain open, and six are on hold. The focus of recent supply requests have been four, non-medical type masks as required by Work Safety Brunswick, thermometers for employee wellness checks, face shields for EMS calls, and physical distance signages, signage for our parks. As mentioned in the previous update, the, the number of supply requests is low, but securing our needs has been challenging due to global demand for the same or similar products. That said, I would offer to share some successes, successes which are due in part to our community more specifically, the ST Group facilitated a 24-hour turnaround in supplying non-medical disposable masks to the City of St. John. Design Art Sign facilitated a 24-hour turnaround in producing physical distance signage for our parks. Ms. Judith Irving facilitated a donation to a community group being supported by St. John EMO's Emergency Social Services Unit. Although not a St. John company, 
Sussex Craft Distillery retooled to produce and supply hand sanitizers in small size formats, which the City of St. John just received in. And most notable, the Irving Blending and Packaging Plant, Division of, of Irving Oil, also retooled to produce hand sanitizer and will soon be making, <coughs> I'm sorry, will soon be donating multiple cases of hand sanitizer to St. John Transit, St. John Police Force, as well as St. John EMO for internal distribution. Our greater community stepped up to support St. John as well as New Brunswick. In closing, I thank Chris Roberts of Materials Management for facilitating the position of Logistics Section Chief last week and again this week, and Minnick McVicker for never failing to find a supply solution. Your Worship, this ends my part of the update. It's now my pleasure to turn the podium over to Deputy Chief Mike Carr to provide an update on, uh, on the 2020 Spring Freshet and closing remarks. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Common Council. I'll provide an update on the 2020 Spring Freshet and offer some closing remarks. Since our last Council report on flooding, the current flood level projections demonstrate the following. Water levels in our area are leveling around 3.1 meters, which is more than one meter below our 4.2 meter flood level. For reference, even at 4.2 meters, there is little impact on critical infrastructure and areas prone to isolation. The current five-day forecast provided by the Department of Environment and local government demonstrates a trend of diminishing flood levels below the Mactaquac Dam that would remove all communities from flood level criteria by week's end. We are currently in a favorable trend of lowering flood, uh, flood waters across the region. Conditions of warm days and cold nights appear to be controlling snowmelt. And if everything stays on target, my estimate is that flooding will not have any significant impact on the St. John region this season. However, I caution that in 2019, most of the flooding occurred in May. Therefore, since this is a natural occurrence, we are remaining vigilant in our preparations to address any changes and closely monitoring the situation. In closing, as you have heard in our St. John EMO report, this is a very dynamic environment that requires a robust response because we are operating in a period of uncertainty. The excellent work done by our St. John EMO team, representative of all city departments, is indicative of the commitment by our senior leadership, staff, and common council to protecting the citizens of St. John. Balancing COVID-19 and flood response is unprecedented, but our training, experience, and commitment have prepared us for these trying times. As the COVID-19 curve begins to flatten and floodwaters level out, we have to remain diligent in our preparations and enhancement of our current response actions. To echo Fire Chief Clifford's comments during our operational brief last Wednesday or last Friday, we must not let our guard down as complacency makes us vulnerable. The current flood level projections are promising, but the impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic are far from over. As we begin our transition to recovery, we must be mindful that recovery is a complex process that also requires a maximum effort. In summary, the dedication of our St. John EMO team, along with the resilience this community has demonstrated thus far, assures me we will overcome these challenging times. Thank you. I'll now hand this over to the city manager for comment. Uh, your worship members of council, uh, two main themes for my comments this evening. The first, I'd, I'd like to pile on to all those who have already recognized and thanked various parts of our city team, or in fact, the entire city team. We have completed now day 34 of our essential services model uh, within a state of emergency. During that time, we have had a large number of our personnel working many extra hours without complaint, and we certainly have had a large percentage of our workforce out and about doing work that is critical to the city uh, in conditions that are anything but the norm. And I simply wish to recognize that as city manager and, if you will, again, pile on and express my sincere thanks to all those who have been involved in dealing with the COVID-19 situation. 
My second comment is a concern on complacency. We now have some anecdotal evidence of more violations, if I can use that term, of chief medical officer of health guidance in terms of physical distancing, no gatherings, no sharing of equipment, etc. I personally believe that some of that increased uh, lack of following the rules, the orders, is because of the incredibly favorable situation that New Brunswick is currently uh, experiencing in comparison to our neighbors, to the rest of the nation, and to the rest of the world. It is a complacency that we can ill afford at this time. And I am reminded of a story that the Premier has used on a few occasions where one person, one person infected with COVID-19 attended a funeral in Newfoundland where that individual uh, contaminated 17 others. And those 17 then in turn contaminated over 150 others. It does not take much to change our very favorable situation in the city and the province to one that would be far less favorable. And then cert therefore, certainly as city manager, I continue to re remind and request that everybody follow very closely all of the guidance and the direction that has been provided by our various authorities. With that, your worship, that concludes the operations briefing for this evening. Subject to any questions or comments that council may have. Okay, thank you very much, city manager. Questions, comments, just would like to say thank you as well. And certainly city manager uh, and to the team that just briefed us, we certainly do live in complicated times. You know, when, uh, when you look at some of the things happening south of the border and uh, we certainly, it's let's, uh, let's stay focused and let's stay diligent. I think your team gave great advice here today and, and uh, as others spoke to. So, okay. Thank I'm you. Great team, Kyle. Thank you. Then seconded by Councillor McKenzie. Thank you. And I'll call that question. All those in favor, please signify with your hand. Okay, perfect. Anyone contrary minded? Not seeing any. And I think we forgot uh, receiving file on 12 1, Common Clerk, did we? Uh, your Worship, you had a mover and seconder uh, for 12.1. I'm not sure if you called the question or not. I, I don't recall. So just in case, Councillor Hickey can move it again. And a seconder, uh, Councillor McKenzie, thank you. And uh, on a receiving file on 12.1, the essential service update. All those in favor? <laughs> thank you. And uh, anyone contrary minded? Not seeing any. Okay, thank you. That's uh, great. Next item, please, Common Clerk. 12.3, uh, Your Worship, is a verbal update uh, with respect to the sewer system and flushable wipes. Okay, uh, Commissioner McGovern, this is a very important topic I've seen from other cities as well, so over to you, sir. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council, thank you for this opportunity. Um, just wanted to provide uh, an update as it relates to our sewer system, and in particular, flushable wipes or so-called flushable light wipes. This is never a good time for uh, anyone to experience a backup of a sewer into their home or apartment, particularly now when we're self-isolating at home due to COVID-19. It's definitely a situation we all want to avoid. Nobody wants a situation that would force someone out of their home where they are safest. As your Commissioner of St. John Water and as the Chair of the Atlantic Canada Water and Wastewater Association, I'm urging everyone to not flush anything other than human waste and toilet paper down the toilet. As we're all aware, uh, recently there was a rush on purchasing toilet paper recently that uh, forced some people to consider alternative products. Uh, also, people are naturally more attentive to cleaning and using disposable wipes in many instances at this time. Please note these wipes cannot be flushed down your toilet, nor can rubber gloves, dental floss, so-called flushable wipes, paper towels, hygiene products, uh, grease, or anything of that nature. All those items need to go in the garbage. Our municipal sewer system, like others in the country, are built to handle solar human waste and toilet paper that's specifically designed to break down quickly. Anything else will put, uh, uh, anything else should be going in the, uh, into the uh, garbage and properly disposed of. Just last week alone in St. John, we had three sewer backups uh, that caused damage to properties. 
uh, also uh, resulted in uh, in um, the expenditure of overtime and uh, in disruption to uh, to people in the situation. So these uh, backups place a financial strain on on our budgets, but also uh, unnecessarily put uh, private and public property at risk. So we uh, like. Other Canadian municipalities, as you'd mentioned, Your Worship, are seeing a significant uh, upward spike in, in the number of sewer backups attributable to these fl flushing of items. And in closing, I would urge all St. Johners not to flush anything uh, down the toilet except for human waste and uh, toilet tissue. And with that, Your Worship, I'd uh, turn it back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, Councillor Reardon. Comment? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so these uh, wipes say flushable on them? They do say flushable. That, that's correct, Your Worship. Um, the Canadian Water and Wastewater Association has been working with the Manufacturers Association for quite some time now to try and get the word flushable removed from the advertising on these products. Uh, just because they say they're flushable, they are not, uh, and we have experienced that time and time again, as ha as has other municipalities across Canada. So, uh, encourage anything that's as flushable, unless it's toilet tissue, it's not flushable. Okay, so it would be curious to see if other municipalities would get together because that needs to be dealt with, uh, in my opinion, and either with a lawsuit against the companies that are doing it or whatever it would take. I don't know, but there would be more power in getting two municipalities together. And the other question I have is if you are having a problem with people flushing wipes and I don't know how like uptown my my sewer line and my neighbors has a B connector. So it would be one line going up between the two. But if I if you knew it was from my place and I you find wipes in there, I think we should charge the whole the whole thing back to the homeowner. The cost of all of the uh, of the repairs for that sewer line. I you know, I think we, we need to have some um, opportunity to recoup our losses when we keep saying the same thing over and over again, that you can't flush those things. Um, and with especially with our new system, I don't know what they're made out of, but uh, anyways, it's just, that's just a couple of ideas. I would be very supportive of charging it all back to the homeowner if they're going to insist on using something that isn't designed. I mean, you could put anything down a toilet, but it doesn't mean that's not going to destroy your line. So at the end of the day, you have to be cognizant of what is safe to put down your toilet. And I think we've made that pretty clear so far. So that's all. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's a good, sorry, that's a good point, uh, Your Worship. Uh, the, and our, our bylaw does speak to that in terms of um, prohibiting uh, the uh, discharge of certain items. And, uh, uh, you know, if it were clear, we do have the authority to... Uh, to issue fines for violations of this nature. Uh, we have been seeing that it has been getting out of the laterals and, and uh, more collecting in our sewer system, but we are monitoring that. And thank the public for their assistance in avoiding any further uh, backups in uh, St. John. Thank you. Um, I You've taught me something tonight, not that you can't flush wipes. I didn't realize that there were some providers that were uh, marketing their product as flushable. So that's obviously a very serious uh, issue. And then I just wonder, uh, Mr. McGovern, if uh, Commissioner, if there's an opportunity to, you know, in the interim to try to work with local retailers, you know, with signage or something that says this is, you know, this is not fl flushable. Anyway, the, the message is crystal clear from you tonight that uh, nothing can go down. Uh, there's no wipe that is flushable uh, that can go down into the sewer system. And it's causing uh, not only here, I've seen uh, from Moncton, I believe, and other communities where they're uh, they're having to completely disassemble their system to get these, uh, these, these clogs out of the system. So, okay, well, thank you for that very thank important you. update uh, tonight. Uh, receive and file, please. So moved. Okay, Councillor McKenzie and Councillor Sullivan. Thank you. <laughs> Hands all going up all at the same time. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, call the question. All those in favor? Anybody contrary minded? Not seeing any. The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Next item, Common Clerk. 
Uh, next item is 12.4 on your agenda, and it's COVID-19 financial impact report. Thank you. City Manager is going to uh, introduce and then... Uh, you're with the members of council. I think it's fair to say that most large organizations, if they have one significant financial challenge, it can be all-consuming to the organization in terms of dealing with it and mapping a path forward. As your city manager, I would suggest to you that the city of St. John is not currently facing one financial challenge, but rather four. The first financial challenge we face is the reality of COVID-19 and the lost revenue to the city and how we will deal with that lost revenue. The second challenge we face is also related to COVID-19 in that the municipality, when we're looking at recovery, has to see what is possible from a financial perspective in terms of helping with that recovery, even though, if I can use the expression, the cupboard may be bare, we still nonetheless need to consider how we might contribute financially to recovery. That's the second challenge we face. The third is what has already been discussed many times with this council, the forecasted deficit, and I stress forecasted, deficit of $10 million that hits us on the 1st of January of 2021, which is seven months from now. And then the fourth deficit, the fourth challenge we face is the long-term transformational reforms that are needed so that we can stop talking on a yearly basis about what we are next going to cut within the city of St. John. Those four challenges are all incredibly important. And this evening we will begin by having our chief financial officer, Mr. Kevin Fudge, speak about the first two challenges related to COVID-19. Commissioner Fudge, over to you. Uh, good evening. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Anybody see my slide deck? We had it for a moment, Kevin. We've lost it again. Can you see it now? No, you're going to have to redo the sharing process, please. Okay. Can you see that? We have it now, but we have the split screen view. Okay. Is that good? Go. All right. Uh, apologize for that inconvenience. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Common Council. Uh, before you this evening is a COVID-19 financial impact assessment. This very same presentation was made to the Finance Committee uh, last week on April 15th. Uh, that this presentation was unanimously uh, approved and recommended to be brought forth to Common Council here this evening. Uh, we did discuss this presentation in quite sufficient detail at the Finance Committee meeting. It was an open session meeting. It was streamed. It's been reported on uh, by the media. So I will touch upon only the salient points in this presentation, and I'll skip some of the other points or some of the other slides that uh, aren't as necessary. Uh, first, before I start this presentation, I did want to recap and reiterate and reinforce, I guess, what the city manager uh, just mentioned with respect to the number of financial files uh, that we're reviewing at this very moment, the very distinct and different uh, number of files that we're working on simultaneously here uh, in the finance department 
to safeguard the city's future financial position. First and foremost, uh, as council is very much aware, uh, the short-term financial assistance from the province that the city has depended on for the last three operating budgets come to, comes to an end at the end of this year. So as part of the city manager's restructuring plan and the work that the finance department is doing, uh, that plan will provide permanent adjustments to the city's business, to put in place uh, business changes to address the $10 million projected deficit as the city manager had mentioned. And again, those projections are subject to changes uh, based on whatever tax base uh, we receive for 2021 later this year. The second plan we're monitoring uh, is the city's long-term financial plan. And this plan sets council's 10-year long-term financial targets for debt reduction, infrastructure renewal, our wage control, revenue growth, and reserve funding to improve the city's fiscal health and reduce, reduce the city's overall tax rate. And finally, that brings us to this third file here tonight, the proposed COVID-19 cost mitigation strategy. Jump right in here. Uh, the economic shutdown due to coronavirus uh, has wreaked havoc on municipalities across the country, across North America. Cities are facing dire financial impacts from the loss of bus fares, parking revenues, permit revenue, and other revenues generated from our own sources. This slide, this next slide, provides some examples of municipalities that are dealing with the same financial challenges that the city of St. John is, is currently experiencing. And I won't go through every uh, municipality. We did that at the finance committee meeting. Um, but just uh, uh, as recent as Friday, the city of Toronto updated their projections and that they believe they could lose on a best case scenario, $1.5 billion as a best case scenario. And as a worst case, $2.7 billion uh, based on their current finance department's financial projections. So cities are facing massive financial shortfalls without legally being able to run any operating deficits, unlike provincial and federal governments, as you are very well aware. And uh, I guess a really a, a distinguishing factor here is cities, municipalities receive only 12 cents for every $1 of tax collected. 88 cents on every dollar is collected by federal and provincial governments. And more and more social and economic responsibilities continue to be downloaded to municipalities. And I, just a reference on this slide to the fair tax expert, Enid Slack, who provided some comments to the Global Mail. We've, we've had uh, Ms. Slack provide us a fair taxation report for the city of St. John back in 2016. And she continues to suggest that governments need to take a hard look at fair tax distribution between levels of government. And we continue to advocate for that right here at the city of St. John, and we have been since 2016. I'm gonna skip the next two slides, and jump right into the financial analysis. Turning to the best and worst case cost projections for the city of St. John, I do wanna to stress to council that our projections are ever changing. They're continuously evolving. And as we receive new facts, figures, and data information, we will continue to update these projections. Council should also be aware that these projections are based on the detailed submissions and work that was provided by city departments and agency boards and commissions. And that our best case scenario in this financial model is based on a scenario where we achieve a state of normalcy by the end of June, June 30th. And the worst case scenario in this financial model is a scenario where the pandemic would last for the remainder of the year. These estimates are also premised in the city providing service delivery based on the essential service model recommended by the city manager. <coughs> this is an important point I just want to stress. If there was to be direction in the future to provide services over and above an essential services model that's recommended by the city manager and is uh, coordinated with respect to the assumptions in this financial model, uh, it would change projections in the model. Well, this is a graphical representation of our estimates. Our best and worst case financial impact estimates for projected revenue loss for the City of St. John's General Fund, which also incorporate St. John Transit, ranges between four and $9 million approximately, as representing revenue we would project to lose if the COVID event lasted somewhere between three and nine months. 
In addition to the general fund impact, St. John Water, we are projecting, would also be severely impact with respect to what we're seeing in metered revenue consumption. We're currently seeing, working with the Commissioner of St. John Water, approximately a 25% reduction in water consumption, for which if this trend continued for three to nine months, that would represent a loss somewhere between one and $3 million. That would bring the total projected financial loss projection for the City of St. John between five and $12 million on a best and worst case scenario to the general and St. John water funds. So we must continue to manage through two financial restructuring efforts simultaneously. One being a permanent restructuring effort to balance the city's budget in 2021 and a temporary financial restructuring effort to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. The cost mitigation strategy is a strategy that will enable us to absorb the short-term shock of these significant revenue losses in the most fiscally responsible manner that it adheres to our long-term objectives in the long-term financial plan and our service delivery obligations to the public. Just some uh, bullets on what's included in the cost mitigation plan strategy to absorb these revenue losses. And just very quickly, the plan includes workforce adjustments, facility closures, service reductions, and service levels at a essential services model. This slide is a graphical representation with respect to the city's plan to reduce costs in the general fund to offset those expected revenue losses. And just very quickly, I'll summarize this. 33% of the cost mitigation strategy for COVID-19 will be in the form of wage and benefit initiatives, which include reduction in the casual workforce, foregoing filling any vacancies in the organization, restricting the approval of overtime, and forego foregoing planned hiring of seasonal workforce this summer. 15% of the plan has been addressed by council's approval last week of the renegotiated contract with Discover St. John. 31% of this plan represents reductions in operating costs stemming from reductions in fuel, uh, vehicle parts, equipment rental, shop supplies, as a result of a reduced service level, uh, basically operating in an essential service uh, model. 11% of the cost mitigation plan is achieved through reduction in St. John Transit service. And 7% in the reduction, or sorry, 7% of this plan represents discretionary freezes on professional fees, consulting fees, goods and services that are not related extensively to our sustainability efforts. St. John Water also, through the Commissioner of Water, has put together a cost mitigation strategy. Cost mitigation strategy for St. John Water includes 21% 20 in wages and benefit reduction in the budget, 36% reducing goods and services, and 25% by deferring capital spending. Under our worst case scenario, that we continue to be in this state of a emergency, COVID-19. And if this was to last over a nine month period, uh, this slide represents the total impact on wage and benefits for the city of St. John and its agency boards commission uh, that would form part of our COVID-19 cost mitigation strategy. And you can see over a nine month period, the impact consolidated on the various components of the budgets would be over $6 million in wages and benefits that would have been normally budgeted uh, for 2020. It also means that the financial model assumes we will continue providing essential services and we should expect service level adjustments based on an essential services model. And I won't go through all these service impacts or potential service impacts. A city manager touched upon them and he will touch upon them later on. But what is normally provided uh, including, we should expect to see continued facility closures under this scenario of continued COVID-19, uh, suspension of programming, reduced maintenance on city properties like ball fields and playgrounds, landscaping. You can see many of the impacts on this slide and the next slide. 
We went through again, this in extensive detail at the finance committee meeting. In conclusion, we are managing and monitoring three financial plans, the restructuring plan to ensure that we address the 2021 shortfall in the budget, currently projected at $10 million. COVID-19 cost mitigation plan that we are looking at a potential loss between five and $12 million in consolidation on a consolidated level, depending how long the event transpires. And we continue to monitor our long-term financial plan to put the city back on a long-term financial sustainable course. We also recognize, although the city has very limited financial capacity to do so, that the city plays a role in the community's economic recovery efforts. And with that, I'll turn the last slide over to the city manager who addressed this as part of his recommendations to Common Council with respect to this presentation. Uh, your worship members of, uh, sorry, can you keep that slide up, Kevin? Thank you. Your worship members of council, um, before I talk about these specific four recommendations, uh, just one very quick uh, point. What you have been presented is a financial analysis uh, that basically says we have between five and $12 million of lost revenue, but we have th the mitigation in place that is necessary in order to continue to balance our books. What this presentation is not is a detailed cost mitigation plan. Quite frankly, that's a living document. It changes every day as the staff continue to monitor the situation, uh, refine the revenue losses that we know we are incurring, and what cost mitigation is necessary to achieve it. Although we do not have a detailed cost mitigation plan to provide to you this evening based on what I just mentioned, there are four specific recommendations that we wish to put before Council this evening to seek your endorsement. The first is we do have a $2 million winter weather reserve designed for the next snowmageddon that we may have within this city. In other words, a singular event that puts incredible pressure on our delivery of services. Now that we are living through a pandemic, it is fair to say that perhaps that winter weather reserve should be broadened in scope. And therefore, although we are not recommending its use at this point in time, we are recommending that the reserve be redesignated as an emergency service reserve. In order to deal with our second financial uh, challenge, which is to try to do what we can to help spur recovery, we are recommending that 80% of our current uh, non-attributed growth reserve be dedicated to serve as a recovery fund details of which to be determined as we work through the recovery effort uh, in order to help and spur the economic recovery within the city of St. John. The third recommendation is to seek council's formal endorsement of a reduction in operating costs for St. John Transit and in fact setting the bar at 25% no later than May 15th unless federal and provincial funds become available to offset that reduction. In speaking with transit, the number of 25% is determined to be attainable with, uh, and still providing minimum essential public transit uh, to the community. And finally, simply an acknowledgement on behalf of uh, Common Council that as we move forward from here, uh, our cost mitigation strategy is very much focused on the essential services model and short-term service reductions and that any future council direction to reinstate some of those services will compromise our ability to mitigate the overall costs. With that, your worship members of council, subject to your questions and comments. Perfect, okay, thank you. Comments, questions, council? Mayor Matthew, you're first up. I see you, Councillor uh, Reardon. I see you, Councillor Hickey, Casey. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, firstly, a thank you to staff. Um, a lot of work went into this. We realized it's a flowing document. We realized it's, a, it's, it's um, a lot of gives and takes. Uh, um, but um, our friends of the province do in, in, in relation to opening up the province, so on and so forth. But I do want to say this. There's an old saying that says, necessity is the mother of invention. 
and we will get through this. Um, we will get through this. What I hope at the end of the day is we get through this as a better community. We've got the ability, we've, we've got something in front of us now that I hope when we come through the other side, we are a stronger community. I mean, all of us in the region. I hope we're, 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 we're better at cooperation, that we're more efficient. Uh, I hope some good comes out of this. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Reardon, I had you next. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions. I'm wondering about the redesignate of the $2 million winter weather reserve. If we put that into an emergency service reserve, um, are there any, would there, what would the parameters be to access it? I'm just wondering if we later want to maybe uh, incent growth or do something with it. Uh, through your worship uh, to the councillor, we the city of St. John has a, revert, a reserve fund policy, uh, and there's all, there's parameters within that policy that need to be followed. Every withdrawal from that reserve uh, would need to be aligned with that policy. Would actually have to be approved by Common Council. So there are checks and balances and and steps within that policy that we would want to make sure that we're aligned with. So that would only be only, if it goes into that fund, then it would only be used for an emergency. It couldn't be used for anything else. I guess what the city manager is suggesting is we broaden the designation from simply being a winter weather reserve. Based on the fact that since 2015, we've had some normal winter weather um, and that there may be some opportunity to broaden that uh, in order to offset any one-time short-term uh, unforeseen events that may occur uh, with respect to an emergency. I'll just make a quick comment when I the slide about um, the uh, projected impact on municipal funded wages and benefits of 6.3 million over nine months. I guess at the end of the day, there's strategic decision making and there's crisis mode decision making. So I want to stay on the strategy path as much as possible. And I guess this is where I had the struggle earlier with spending six million for roads. Uh, in the consent budget, and there we've got six million there that could be a potential for us over nine months. And I look at roads and I say, what's the return on the investment of roads? Um, how does it? How do roads directly correlate with growth? Um, they're being torn apart by industry to the tune of two point four million dollars, I think, a year. So I guess that's where I have a struggle with some of this. So I want to make sure that we stay on the strategic uh, decision-making, and I'm, I'm not really even sure what that is to a certain extent, but uh, the report is great. I'm on finance, and uh, we saw it last week. So uh, I guess we'll just keep going and and hope that the moves that we make on this chessboard with all of these kind of dragons around the corner that we can get to where we want to go at the end of the day. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hickey. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, uh, and certainly thanks to Kevin and staff for this. Uh, the level of leadership and uh, significance in this is obvious, and, uh, and I think it resonates very well. But certainly, you know, the impact on uh, our ability to provide services and the impact on an already stressed uh, budget is very, very evident. I'm wondering if there have been any inclination or outline around provincial or federal support for municipalities uh, in the wake of COVID-19? I, uh, I can keep my eye on that, obviously, as, as something of, of interest for the city of St. John. I know FCM is actively advocating that uh, municipalities desperately need funding. I mean, it's, there's no secret. Look at the uh, issues across the country with respect to municipal shortfalls. It's significant. Um, and often our services are frontline. It's what the residents experience. Um, and, and our services are, are uh, critical to supporting our residents. So uh, nothing significant as of yet that I've seen, um, but we're keeping our eye on it. Commissioner, is it something that we've been advocating on for uh, on behalf of the city? Have we been advocating with the province or with the feds internally? And is it something we should be if it's not? City manager, do you want to jump in? Or city manager, yeah. whoever. Yeah. Um, your worship to the councillor. Uh, yes, absolutely. We have been advocating this through a number of forms. First of all, 
the eight cities of New Brunswick have a representative on FCM. And through that, we push recommendations into the, sorry for those who aren't aware, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We push uh, our input to the federal level, to the government there. Uh, I am on a, uh, a every other day coordination conference with the province. And I can assure you that on that call every other day, either I or other city chief administrative officers are pushing the issue of uh, we're compensating businesses, we're compensating individuals, that's all great, but we also need to consider compensating municipalities for their, not so much for every last penny, uh, we, we have a role to play in this as well, obviously, but for a large ticket item such as the in, in, uh, exponential increase in our transit costs because we want to continue to provide that essential service, uh, those sorts of things is what we're asking the province to take a look at. Yeah, and, and certainly from my perspective, with cuts as significant as these, in conjunction with sustainability uh, items that are that we've discussed this evening as well, and potential cuts there as well, I, I just I see these as such significant items that uh, we really need. Uh, both provincial and federal leadership to step up on this and make sure that uh, that we receive uh, adequate support for the impact that uh, COVID-19 is having on us as a municipality um, because of the corner we've been put in uh, in our financial situation and certainly the one that we have a role to play in as well. So I, I hope that I hope to see that the province steps up. That's good to hear. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Casey. Thank you, Worship. Councillor Blake, I see you, and Deputy, you're up, and uh, Councillor Blake, I see you. Thanks for turning the light on, Councillor Blake. Off you go, Councillor Casey. Thank you. Uh, this is going to probably, uh, you know, go on to what we're going to talk about later as well, but I'm hoping that uh, this is going to uh, help our strategic planning in a sense that uh, with transit and some of these core services that, that uh, we do and and hopefully that we can make sure that we can you know we can uh, supply these uh, without any disruption hopefully forever preferably because uh, uh, you know, because we're going to be here, you know, as councillors, we're going to be hearing about this uh, from constituents and, and the public. And uh, I'm just hoping for a better strategic plan on being able to afford these basically forever and not having to, you know, cut services or, you know, and, and maybe some sort of reserve would be helpful in that. But uh, just going forward, hopefully we can, you know, plan these things out better so, you know, we don't get into financial hardships later on down the road. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor? Uh, you're muted, Deputy. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, thank you, Worship. Um, Kevin, thank you for the report. Can we just talk for a minute about... Uh, our facilities like uh, to be it, right now they're all closed. The staff are all laid off. And if we had, if this is over, say in three months, four months, and some of the facilities can open and have events, maybe not have public participation, but um, have events and is it to our advantage to perhaps think of uh, having one or two of the facilities not open this year in terms of what we have to pay, how much money is being added up, the costs that they're happening right now and going forward? Like, for instance, if we didn't reopen the aquatic center, is that to our advantage or should we reopen it if we're allowed to when the time comes financially 
Do you know what I mean? Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, I can hear you. I, I guess uh, you're, uh, there's a governance question uh, within your question. Um, you know, uh, you know, from a funding perspective, we're, we're, it's no secret that these regional facilities uh, incur deficits. And there's legislation that uh, prescribes that participating municipalities are to fund those operating deficits. Um, so, you know, from a, if, if it's as such, if we got back into a state of normalcy, I guess the first thing I can say is we didn't include, we included assumptions in our model that we're not a light switch, that in three months you'd flip on the light switch and everything's completely back to normal. You have all your revenues. We did include a ramping assumption into our models, recognizing there, was, recognizing there would be a, a ramping back of, of uh, net income and revenue as we get back into a state of normalcy. Uh, but with respect to funding levels and budgets, those would all be decisions of council that would have to be uh, debated on whether uh, you know those funding levels to support those regional facilities uh, that you've approved in your budgets are something you want to revisit. And there's a step before that, actually, city manager, perhaps, like, and it's whether you can even open in the first place. So uh, with no, the state if, of emergency. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm trying to figure out, just say we are allowed to open. Is it to our benefit to open this year or would it save us money by waiting a, a period of time before opening? I think your worship to uh, the deputy mayor, the best way to answer that question is to simply recognize that that question will need to be answered. Uh, it will very much depend on the situation, how much of the year is left, what would be the anticipated cost of reopening the facility compared to the revenue it might uh, generate, what would be the public good of reopening that uh, venue, what would be the impact on the economic recovery, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, for a number of the re these regional facilities, it would not be solely at the discretion of council in that they are regional facilities. There are commissions involved and those commissions will play an active role in those discussions and that analysis. But uh, again, the best way to answer the question is to say the question will need to be answered uh, as we get into those situations. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Armstrong. You're muted, sir. You're muted, Councillor. There you go. All this high tech. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, these aren't just my words. These are people that have been talking to me for the last three weeks. These are hard questions. I appreciate the report and what staff has done on this. But as uh, Councillor Reardon did mention, this is a crisis. We went from hard times where you spoke about it in the, you know, the 10 million trying to find. So the questions I have to ask is, have we made the hardest choices right now as a business? The people who have taken a serious hit here is a private enterprise. Everybody in it has taken a severe hit. The first thing that got hit was people. When they had to close their doors, the first thing gone there's people. And I, the questions that I get asked are, we're running buses empty. Day and night, we're running buses. This isn't a criticism. This is something we have to look at and make tough decisions for down the road. We're spending tens of thousands of dollars for empty buses to run them every day. For the few. That's one. The other is when you were in private business, the first thing that got hurt, like I said, was people. And we have certain contracts we have to honor, but we have a $7 million payroll every month. It would take a few thousand, but it's, I think it's $7 million, isn't it, Commissioner Fudge? $7 million. Do We have to look at the hard choices. I know we've sent people home, but that payroll is still there. I have 15 employees. You know how many I have now? Zero. And that, I'm just a small business. The Hilton Hotel, all the hotels, thousands of people laid off. So I think as a city, and what I'm hearing from my constituents, we have to make these hard choices for the future. Right now, we're funding everything. And as, as the deputy mayor says, you have to shut these facilities down. And not reopen them. And yes, we're going to take flack as counselors. 
But that's the tough decisions for the future because we have zero money coming in. The tax bills, nobody's going to pay their taxes. You got till what, May or June to pay taxes. And hopefully most people will pay them. But the reality is a lot of people aren't. Apartment owners aren't getting rent. These are the decisions. So if when you're looking from a constituent, who I represent as a counselor, that's the questions they're asking. What are we doing as a city making the hard choices for the future? We're going to take $2 million out of a reserve. That's not going to be there next year. We might take it out. But if we do, use it to other places to supplement money. Shouldn't we be making the hard cuts or the hard cuts? It's beyond my pay grade. Yeah. It's for, for, for the finance committee to make those decisions. And I'd like to be involved. We have to be involved. But I, the point is, have we made enough decisions and enough cuts right now for the future? So just quickly, and I'll turn it over to the city manager to add his comments. Um, I think you're talking about a couple of uh, simultaneous decision points that we have. First of all, I went through that presentation quite quickly, but at the finance committee meeting, we did talk extensively about reserves. We talked about the fact that we got to resist taking the easy way out, draining reserves to absorb, to uh, to address this problem, that those reserves are long-term reserves that we need to rely upon. Um, and it took us a long time to build those reserves up to become more flexible, more sustainable. So we got to protect that. Um, so we did talk about that extensively, and, and the recommendation for the city manager does not signify in any way that we intend to draw reserves to address any of these crises that we have right now. So that's the first point. Um, second point, I think some of those tough, tough decisions you're referring to, you'll probably get some of those answers uh, when the city manager goes through his restructuring plan. So we're trying to uh, address a short-term financial shortfall, which is the COVID-19, and we believe, based on the plan that we have in place, you saw there's about $6 million in wages that are on that plan in a very short amount of time in, nine, in a nine-month period. Um, we believe the short-term crisis of COVID-19, that we have a plan in place. Is it changing? Is it evolving? Could it change more? Yes, it's changing every day, but we believe we have a plan in place. In terms of the long-term structural issues with our business, uh, the long-term issues with respect to addressing a 10, potentially plus million dollar shortfall, those are the tough decisions that council will have to make as part of the restructuring plan, the restructuring efforts of the city of St. John, which the city manager will get into a little bit later in this in this agenda. All right, thank you very much. And I, I am one for those reserves. It, it started at this council, and because the commissioner fush, we have those reserves, and they're for the certain we we voted as a council for those reserves for certain things. And I believe if you're in business, you leave the reserve, and they cut other things. Just like every other private enterprise has done. They've cut everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any, um, anyone else? Okay, thank you. I have a couple of comments. Sorry, uh, Councilor Reardon. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, just in a response to that, that currently that we are not running any empty buses right now. We can only put 10 people. First, my husband told me. You can only put 10 people on the bus at a time. So we have the seats all roped off, which makes the bus look like it's empty with only 10 people on it. So that's part of our issue. And I guess if you want to do the um, the hard choices, there's lots of hard choices. And for me, roads is one of those. That's an easy one for me. But, you know, it's not an easy one for everybody. Ray gets calls. But we all get calls about it. That might, that I mean, that's a big ticket item. So, uh, and the other thing I was going to say is that over the last 60 years, the city's increased its size times 10. And uh, so instead of being 35 square kilometers, we're now 300 and just over 300. So we have a lot more, we've got 600, uh, we've got 600 kilometers of roads, which is 1200 lane kilometers. So roads, like I said before, I don't, I don't see the correlation between roads and growth. I don't see the return on your investment in roads. I don't see all that. So that's my, that's the other side of that coin, but we aren't running empty, empty buses right now. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, city manager, you want to jump in for a moment? Your Worship, if I may, it's just a long, long night ahead of us here, folks. So, just just one fi final thought. Um, COVID nineteen is a short term financial pressure. Whether short term is six months or three years has yet to be determined. But it's a short term financial pressure. And I use the analogy: we need to be careful uh, not to win the battle and lose the war. 
What we cut now will have effects moving forward. And I'll give a very simplistic example. Uh, we could choose this year to not do green space debris cleanup and not mow the grass in any of our green spaces. What that would mean is next year, we would probably be replacing all of the grass at twice the cost. Uh, same sort of argument with road and I, roads, and I understand what Councillor Reardon is saying, but if you ignore your road maintenance for a year, you're going to pay for it in a significant way in the subsequent years. So it is one of the determinants as we take a look at this co uh, cost mitigation strategy about making sure that we do things that will help us in the short term, but not hinder us in the longer term. And I just throw that out there as an additional food for thought as we work through this in the next couple of months. Okay, thank you, Councillor Merrithew. And nothing more to say, just to move the motion, please. Okay, uh, moved and seconded by Councillor Sullivan. Thanks. Just a couple of comments for me, I guess. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm appreciating the passion around this issue. Uh, something I was worried about out of the gate. I think we have confirmation tonight of a direct hit. I think I said the same thing at finance. Thank you for uh, the, the early uh, analysis, Commissioner Fudge. Thank you, city manager and team for the, the early mitigating factors. I think what's going to be critical for us here is that we figure out, continue to have really important conversations about how we position the city and the region to grow and thrive. And, and again, I, that's that's um, it's roads and it's moving people and it's recreation, it's arts and culture, it's all those things as we come together to recover. A couple of quick comments uh, to you, Councillor Hickey. Uh, we did have a call, uh, mayors from around the province with the uh, Premier uh, late last week, Friday. And I can assure you that uh, the whole issue of provincial and federal government's involvement in municipalities recovering from COVID-19 was, uh, was loudly registered uh, with the Premier, so just so you know. And then, in fact, tomorrow morning, uh, the Eight Cities Association has a call where Minister Carl is going to be joining us, so we'll continue to have those conversations. Um, I know City Manager and Commissioner of Finance, you're registering maybe the rebranding of some reserves, but that we have reserve policies in place. I have a lot of questions about uh, the growth reserve. I'm, I don't think I'm in the, you know, for example, I, I'm in the uh, I don't think I'm in the mindset of uh, being a loan, giving out loans on recovery, but I also appreciate city manager that you're just saying, hey, we, we, we're likely going to be called on as a municipality uh, to be part of recovery. I'm game for that. I agree with you, but there's going to be, I want to see details you know, maybe maybe there's some incentive to low-income seniors or, you know, or, or other groups that is, you know, uh, a way that we help uh, the community directly through this. I know we don't know those answers yet, uh, and I know we're going to have lots of conversations moving forward. So I'll stop there and I'll say thank you for the discussion and for the report, and I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. Anyone contrary-minded? Not seeing any, that's the unanimous acceptance for tonight. Thank you. Uh, next item, common clerk, please. Uh, your Worship, item 12.5 on your agenda is the sustainability plan update. Okay, thank you. City Manager, over to you. Your Worship, thank you. Um, before I begin with the formal presentation, uh, because I'm afraid if I do it at the end, it will be lost with all the other stuff that we'll be speaking about. I would like to offer uh, recognition to the entire staff team that has been working on sustainability basically for the entire term of this council and certainly council itself for its support and its dedication to the task of addressing sustainability. Uh, forgive me, but I'm gonna use a bit of a visual aid and I realize it's a long evening, but I think it's important to do it. A bit of a visual aid to drive home the amount of time and effort that has been put into this. And I won't go all the way back, but I want to highlight a number of documents that have been produced by this uh, council and this staff. And for each document that I'm going to show you, we need to recognize that there are hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours of time and effort that has gone into them. And I'll go through this very quickly. But for example, we all recognize that growth is a key to our long-term sustainability. We have a roadmap for smart growth. We have a growth population framework. We addressed the issues during the last provincial election and produced a white paper on the issues and the sustainability of St. John. 
We commissioned the Kitchen and Slack Fair Taxation Report. We then took that and put it together in a plan and steps that was uh, approved by council in terms of comprehensive tax reform. The mayor and myself then went to the Standing Committee on Law Amendments this past fall and spoke to him about comprehensive tax reform, both with supporting documents, script, and PowerPoint. After 18 months of effort, there was Sustaining St. John, a three-part plan produced in collaboration and cooperation with the province. That in turn led to the City of St. John restructuring plan. We have since commissioned uh, Deloitte as an independent auditor to take a look at St. John Energies and the options within there. We have an evaluation of what the utility is worth. We have an evaluation of their growth agenda and whether it makes sense. And we have an evaluation of what the utility is worth once their growth agenda is put in place. We also have an addendum that talks about all other city-owned municipal uh, utilities and what sort of dividends they provide to their cities. We produce for the first time ever an annual workforce report that guides a lot of our sustainability discussions. The province and ourselves commissioned another third party auditor to, uh, known as Gardner Pinfold to produce a report on regional costs, to produce a report on heavy industrial costs. And we worked with the eight cities organization to put together a report on the key transformational reforms required by all cities. Through the leadership of our CFO and council, we produced our long-term financial plan, which was preceded by an entire binder worth of financial policies and plans and directives. We commissioned an Ernst & Young operational audit working with the province, which required, again, countless hours of staff input and validation to their findings. We have done expressions of interest to take a look at various regional facilities and whether there's a bit better business model. And we have done countless work with uh, intern to the city and within the region to speak about regional economic development. Forgive me for that little bit of a, of a diversion, but I think it's important to recognize the amount of work that the staff and council has put in to this entire effort of sustainability and putting the city on what I consider to be a very bright path for the future. Uh, with that, I'm going to share my screen and go into the presentation. Uh, this presentation, a form of it, was presented to Finance Committee and received its endorsement. However, since that time, there have been some uh, significant additions and some changes uh, to the presentation. And because of the scope, magnitude, and importance of the material, the entire presentation will be presented this evening. It will not be in an abridged form. In terms of the work undertaken, I've already spoken to most of what's on this slide and will not repeat myself. But in addition to that work that was undertaken, I think it's also important to recognize the engagement. I'm sorry, can I ask everybody to go on mute because we're all of a sudden starting to get feedback? I think it's important to recognize just in the last year, well, in fact, since last August, so not even a year, some nine months, since Sustaining St. John, a three-part plan was, approved, was written, developed, written, and uh, endorsed by this council, the number of times that the issue of sustainability has been discussed, both in open and closed session of council, and you see the numbers here, they are quite significant. With this presentation included for public consumption are a number of different reference materials. Uh, all the ones that I showed you on the first slide in terms of work undertaken are available in one way, shape or form on our website. Uh, these are specific to the presentation of this evening, uh, identified by tabs, and they are all also available on our website with two exceptions that I must explain. When it comes to the St. John Energy Audit, the current evaluation of what the utility is worth and the evaluation of what the utility is worth uh, once its growth agenda has been implemented, in other words, tab I and K are confidential and will not be released to the public. I would uh, hope that everybody would understand that if you are ever going to consider entering into any sort of negotiations, on the purchase, lease, or any other form of one of your uh, organizations, 
you do not divulge ahead of time what you believe the organization is worth, and hence why those two particular reports will remain confidential. The agenda for this evening is to obviously review our restructuring plan as it was previously presented and then provide you updates on the three prongs of the plan. We will start this evening by speaking about prong two, which is addressing the deficit in 21 and 22, because that is the most time sensitive of the three prongs. An important point to mention on uh, this agenda is what we will be asking for this evening. We are only asking for a receive and file motion from council. The reason for that is quite simple. All of this material is being presented today and is being made available to the public today. We need to provide time for the public to digest that information, to offer their comments, to ask their questions, et cetera. And we thought it would be unwise and in fact inappropriate to issue the material some two days before a council meeting and then seek council's endorsement on a series of recommendations. Therefore, we're making it public today. Instead of giving a few days, we are going to give two weeks for the public to digest and enter into public discourse before any decisions are made by council and more on that towards the end of this presentation. This entire presentation now has a significant caveat and that caveat is COVID-19. We still do not know the full impact. We believe most of the impact will be felt in 2020, but there will be some significant lingering effects into 2021. For example, it is possible that property assessments will go down because of COVID-19. And since 91% of our revenue is obtained through property tax, clearly that would have a significant lingering effect. That said, regardless of COVID-19 and where our focus is today dealing with that pandemic, we must move forward now on addressing 2021 and beyond. Now, more than ever, because of COVID-19, the city must improve its competitive advantage if we are to grow quickly and uh, recover as soon as possible from COVID-19. That means several things from a staff perspective. First of all, we need to change the, neg the narrative about the city. We need to focus less on the negative and focus more on the positive. We can do that by having a viable and attainable vision and strategy that resonates with our community and also resonates with future community members, both residential and business. I stress viable because I'm reminded of the saying that I paraphrased here, Having vision is all very well and good, but vision that is improperly resourced is nothing but an hallucination. And therefore, finding a viable path forward is, is essential. We need to solve our recurring deficits that we have had each and every year for, I believe, the last two decades. And we also need to resolve our long-term fin financial pressures. It is commendable that we have all of the policies in place, financial policies in place, but now we need to be disciplined in our approach moving forward. To get that competitive advantage, we also need to reduce our tax rate, and more on that in a moment. We need to make sure that we continue to control our utility rates and ensure that we don't, do not see significant increases in that regard. We need to focus on growth. Growth is the holy grail in terms of our financial picture. But as we focus on that growth, we need to show that we are controlling costs. It is not good enough to simply control the cost. We need to demonstrate that we are doing so. Otherwise, you do not appear to be as competitive as you should be. All of the above will build a, bit, will build a sense of trust and confidence in the city that will be important. In short, Addressing the budget for 2021 is simply not good enough. We must resolve once and for all our financial situation so that we can, in fact, focus on the positive and minimize the negative. To achieve that, we have developed what we call the sustainability wheel, and it is described in some detail in our long-term financial plan. It has eight components. It produces a wheel that permits you to proceed down a road or down a track, whichever analogy or metaphor you would wish to use. 
But clearly, if any portion of that wheel is not present, the wheel does not turn very well. In this particular presentation, you will find that I will touch on pretty much all eight aspects of sustainability. In the interest of time, I won't explain each. I think they're self-explanatory and they are all incredibly important. The restructuring plan that was provided to council some time ago. First of all, in the plan introduction, we stress that we can no longer afford the status quo. Cutting our way to balance budgets needs to be over. It simply will not work moving forward. Our current financial model is unsustainable. Our costs grow annually at about 3%, and a good chunk of that is consumer price index or inflation. And our revenues, based on the last five years, are growing at 1%. This is clearly unsustainable, and therefore every year the city is obliged to consider more costs. Growth is key, because if we can get our revenue above 1%, we will be on our way to solving the problem. But we also need to bring our costs down, and we'll speak more about that during the presentation. As important as tax-based growth may be, we need revenue from other sources as well, through regional cost sharing, regional shared services, and empowerment of cities to generate our own revenue. The restructuring plan that is being presented is not solely focused on addressing the challenge of 21 and 22. We must look longer term. This simplistic diagram shows our challenge, 3% cost increase, 1% growth increase. In any given year, you can cut and make those two lines intersect. But then the very next day, the gap begins to build again. Therefore, our overall plan for restructuring speaks about three prongs. We use the term prongs intentionally because uh, we want to give the image that all three parts, if you will, of the plan occur concurrently or simultaneously. Prong one is a series of effic efficiency and effectiveness reviews that I'll describe this evening and where we are and the development of our policies. Prong two is addressing the very real challenge we have of balancing the budget for 21 and 22. And prong three are the transformational reforms that solve the problem for good. And more on that later. So if I take the simplistic graph that I showed you on a previous slide of costs at 3% and revenue at 1%, and I'll use my pointer here to make the point, right now we are living in this green area where interim government funding is being provided to address the difference between costs and growth. That interim government funding ends on 31 December of this year. We are working through a plan right now to reduce costs and increase revenues where we can, whereby our cost line and our revenue line intersect. And we need to be in that position for the 1st of January, 2021. My point, and the probably the most the overriding point of this entire presentation is that we can crack the champagne bottle on the 1st of January, 2021, to say that we have balanced the budget. And the very next day, we will begin the discussions about what we will need to cut next in order to address the further challenge we have, because the very next day, costs will once again be at 3% and revenue will continue at 1%. We need these transformational reforms so that we are not in this endless cycle of cuts followed by cuts followed by more cuts. Hmm. Uh, forgive me, I'm gonna exit here for just a moment. because this is an important slide and for some reason I have lost a version of it. So I'll just simply call it up from a, um, my apologies for that. 
The other issue I wish to speak about before getting into the details of any particular prong is our tax rate. Our tax rate is shown at this slide at 1.785. And you can see how profoundly out of whack, to use a very scientific term, we are with everyone else. We already have to address a $10 million operating deficit in 2021. That's just to balance the books. That has nothing to do with re reducing the tax rate. If we wanted to get to, for example, Moncton's tax rate at 1.65, we would have to find another 10 million. If we wanted to get to Fredericton's tax rate, we would have to find another 27 million. And if we wanted to be more in line with the Quispan Sis and the Ross says, in fact, put another way, our regional towns, we would be talking in the range of some $35 million more that we ha would have to find. In short, we are not competitive for residential or business growth, and we have the reputation of having the highest tax rate in all of Atlantic Canada, and that is simply not helpful to what we are trying to achieve in terms of our competitive advantage. So forgive me, I'll get out of this presentation and back to the main presentation. and move on to the various prongs. And as I mentioned, the first prong I wish to discuss this evening is prong two, addressing the entirety of the deficit for 21 and 22. The first point I would make is that the forecast is $10 million. That may change. We do not have our property assessment values at the end of 2019, nor do we fully understand the impact of COVID-19 at this point in time. But for the purposes of the remainder of this presentation, we are going to use a $10 million figure understanding that it might change. Our general approach to prong two has been that, quote, all options are on the table. I have put in brackets the term viable because clearly if an option is not attainable, again, I get back to my comment about hallucination, uh, and therefore we did remain focused on those things that we realistically thought we could achieve and that we realistically believe that the community could in one way, shape, or form and council support. We also took a uniform approach across the board in that every part of the organization was to contribute their share. This is a quote out of the original restructuring plan that talked about the importance of making this, the decisions by the end of March. Clearly, we have missed that because of COVID-19, but we are still working towards the notion that we do need the decisions now so that we have time to implement before the budget of 2021. The process we took to find the $10 million was we began approximately a year ago with over 80 ideas as to what we could take a look at. We then refined that and presented 60 plus ideas to council in early fall. We, we analyzed and rated all of those ideas based primarily on council's priorities, their four priorities, and produce heat map plotting for all of them. And in other words, how significant an impact would these various ideas have on council's priorities? We then went through a process that I know was very difficult and time consuming for both staff and council of conducting a screening of all those ideas. The screening was very important, not only to determine what would go in the infamous hopper and not, but also to get feedback from council members on each of the ideas as we were developing them. After we had concluded that portion, we then as staff further refined the ideas, uh, looking at benchmarking, further feasibility analysis, and getting some additional data. And we also refined our evaluation criteria based on comments we received in council. A very simplistic example of that is that council had little to no appetite to consider service level reductions that had a direct impact on safety. We then as staff took all of that feedback and through our refined criteria, including looking at it through a growth lens, had developed what we believe is the most sound approach for addressing the entirety of the deficit. And because we cannot simply rely on achieving the 10 million, any one of those ideas may fall through, or we may have to address more of a deficit. 
we have prepared a standby list. Throughout, four main themes guided our discussions. First of all, early on in the process, Council made a decision that 50% of the entirety of the deficit, whatever that deficit ends up being, will be addressed through workforce adjust adjustments and changes to personnel policies. Right now, today, as we speak, that is $5 million. Where possible, we would divest ourselves of infrastructure to avoid large operating deficits. We would explore new revenue streams, including non-user, non-resident user fees, and we would try to we would explore new and innovative approaches to the delivery of services based on our understanding of best practices and our fundamental reviews, which I'll get to in a moment. What we must have moving forward in order to uh, solve prong two. First of all, we need six months as a minimum to develop the implementation plans for what is being briefed this evening. In other words, we really do need the decisions of council by the end of May. Uh, December is a very problematic work to get a problematic month to get significant work done. So literally the 1st of January is just around the corner. We also need to take the approach that only those initiatives that we know are definitive should be part of the plan. Anything that is problematic because of timing, because of external influences, for example, we need provincial change to legislation, or we have uncertain yields cannot be part of the plan for 1st of January, 2021. It does not mean we do not pursue the idea, but it cannot be part of prong two. And finally, we need to continue to have everyone accept the approach that everyone contributes. We do not focus on only one or two functional areas to address our deficit. So the first part I want to exp uh, explain to you in terms of detail is the first 5 million, the 50% of the entirety of the deficit through workforce adjustments. This singular table explains where we are in terms of achieving that. You see our organizations on the left, less transit that I'll speak about in a moment. You see the target figure that we are looking at for reductions. That is based on their share of the 50% or their share of the 5 million. And then you see in the comment block where we are. For fire, we need 1.36 million, and we will achieve that through collective bargaining, which is ongoing, and or probably in a combination with a reduction in the size of the workforce. And the, the size of the reduction will very much depend on the results of collective bargaining. For police, the letter, the formal letter was sent to the police commission identifying that they needed to find almost $1.2 million. That is ongoing, but collective bargaining at this point in time has ceased and the union has requested to go to binding arbitration. Depending on the results of that binding arbitration, we will likely see significant reduction in the size of the workforce in order to achieve the $1.175 million. For Local 18, through collective bargaining, we have a tentative agreement. That tentative agreement requires the approval of council and the ratification of the membership. And as per the tentative agreement, those the, the approval of council and the ratification by membership is to happen on the same day. Therefore, until we find a way either virtually or through relief of the COVID-19 pandemic to assemble the membership, uh, decisions on that tentative agreement are suspended. For Local 486, their collective agreement does not expire this year, and therefore they will achieve their $680,000 reduction through a reduction in personnel. For management and professional staff, their target is close to $850,000. The decisions have already been made that they will receive a 0% pay raise in 21 and 22 that will not achieve the $850,000. And therefore, there is an additional requirement of a reduction of three to six management and professional staff. And that range is because, of course, it depends what level manager you remove in terms of the, in terms of the cost savings you achieve. Bottom line is that uh, as your city manager, I believe that attaining the $5 million is possible. Uh, and we have mechanisms in place to achieve it by the 1st of January of 2021. 
For transit, in the note at the bottom, transit workforce contributions have not been calculated in the same way. Rather, we recognize that transit, the transit workforce must contribute to the overall plan, and that will occur through the fundamental transit review that is currently ongoing and through the collective bargaining and or reduction of their workforce, depending on the results of that collective bargaining, which is ongoing at this time. The second $5 million. First of all, uh, everybody re recalls the process we went through. This is the list based on the follow-on staff assessment of all of the possibilities of what we should be doing, and this will be the recommendation to Council on Form A. To explain the columns, obviously we describe the initiative. Hopper is the value that we thought we would achieve when it was presented to Council during the screening process. Plan, in some cases, is an amended amount based on our follow-on analysis of what can realistically be achieved and yet still satisfy the will of Council. And the last column is simply when this stuff was presented to council. Uh, I do not propose this evening to go through all of these in detail, but I will very quickly run through the key aspects of all. First of all, permit and development approval fee increases is simply increases primarily due to inflation and CPI since the last time they were increased. Permit and development approvals, new fees. There are some fees that we are simply not charging that other municipalities are in fact charging and we believe it is a viable practice for us to do so. Fire fees for service. Uh, this primarily speaks to things like sending bills for false, repeated false alarms, uh, nuisance alarms and the like. Fire fees for emergency response will not apply to residential response. This really applies to heavy in or to industrial response and also starting to bill for what we call joy seekers and those who get themselves in trouble simply because they're doing things they should not have been doing in the first place. The recreation subsidization value is based on the subsidization policy that was previously uh, approved by council. On-street parking increase is simply an adjustment for CPI since the last time it was uh, done. Parking ticket increase, again, is adjustment for CPI and puts us more in line with our other municipalities. Monthly parking increase, again, is an inflationary adjustment. Non-residential differential parking fee is significant. And those from outside the community who use our roads and place wear and tear on our infrastructure would be asked to pay more for their parking. Adelaide Street is a small amount that has already occurred in terms of renting out some of our space. And new and not described during the screening process, so I'll spend just a little while longer on it, is the notion of heavy vehicle permits. This ha happens in many municipalities across the nation to recognize that heavy vehicles put more wear and tear on our roads and therefore should contribute to the maintenance of those roads. Uh, we in plan on putting together a permit system whereby we believe, as a conservative figure, we, be, we will be able to obtain approximately a million dollars in revenue if and only if we have a viable enforcement mechanism in place and we are working those issues right now. In terms of cost reductions, a couple small reductions in terms of recreational facilities. One arena closure, because quite frankly, we do not have the demand for the arena inventory that we currently have. Winter street maintenance is simply a rationalization or a leveling of our day and night shifts so that we can do plowing both day and night in a significant way. And there is a very modest decrease in uh, equipment. Initially, we had planned on $350,000. That was because we were going to make a major decrease in equipment. But based on further analysis, that uh, proved to be not wise. And therefore, now our savings is really in terms of balancing the workload minimizing overtime, et cetera. Asphalt overlay program sees a minor reduction uh, and we are suspending the growth reserve for a period of two years within this option. We freeze inflationary increases for our goods and services. The transit redesign where initially we talked about up to $2 million in reductions. 
We now have a target for that transit review of $750,000 and then modest decreases to our casual workforce and a reduction to the council budget, yielding approximately 4 million. In addition to that, and I'll show it quickly on the following slide, we have been undertaking a number of continuous improvement initiatives that have been briefed to council, which will yield another million dollars in change to achieve our overall target of $5 million. The challenge, of course, with this list is that, first of all, when it goes to council, uh, council may choose to not do one of these, or probably even more likely, some of these may not achieve the yields in time that we need. And therefore, we need a standby list because we must get the $5 million. Therefore, the remainder of the sustainability items that proved viable and were placed in the hopper are on this list in priority. And if we were short X number of dollars, we would go down this list until we achieved that X number of dollars. We have flexibility to approximately $1.9 million. However, uh, and again, I'm not going to go through this this evening, but when you take a look at the profound service impacts of some of these things on the list, it is certainly our, our hope as staff that we do not use a standby list. And if we do, that we do not go down it very far in order to achieve our overall target of $5 million. And this, as promised, is the continuous improvement list that has been briefed to council over the last many months, yielding approximately one point. Uh, $1 million, and we are fairly confident that that is a pretty sound figure moving forward. So with that, between the workforce adjustments and what I just described, we achieve the overall $10 million. We come to this point on the graph, prong two implemented. Of course, we then have the challenge that the very next day, we start to uh, build the gap again. So the purposes of prong one and three, which I'm going to get through next, is to bring costs down and bring revenue up so that the two lines remain parallel moving forward and we are no longer into cuts, followed by cuts, followed by more cuts. So I wish to turn my attention to prong one and speak about the fundamental reviews and our policy development. First of all, in terms of financial policies, with great credit to our chief financial officer and his team, but also with great credit to council, we now have in place the series of financial policies, including the long-term financial plan to impose the discipline that is required moving forward. The next step in terms of our policies is to develop the overall 10-year vision and strategy document. Some would argue that that should have been prepared first, but the urgency of getting our financial house in order insisted that we do other policies first and roll it all up into our overall 10-year vision and strategy. So at the bottom of this diagram, you see all of the supporting plans, including such things as Play SJ, neighborhood plans, et cetera. Uh, they inform, and then we receive council priorities, organizational objectives, and environmental analysis which leads to our overall plan SJ and our 10-year financial plan, which then can be rolled up into that 10-year vision and strategy document, which would be a living document adjusted on a yearly basis. In short, our policies need to be much more than just finances. It needs to describe where we wish to be in 2030 and beyond. For the reviews, first of all, we, uh, made the decision to review all agency boards and commissions to find efficiencies. We wanted a new economic development framework. We wanted a new organizational structure for City Hall. We wanted to review all of our infrastructure and we wanted with provincial funding to complete an operational audit. Where are we? Uh, sorry, where can we use the results of those reviews? Well, first of all, we believe that two of the reviews will see the savings that we need in time for the 1st of January, 2021. That's the organizational structure review and the transit review. Therefore, the results of those two reviews have been rolled in to the 1st of January, 2021, prong to addressing the deficit. The remaining interviews will, the remaining reviews will not reap dividends in time for the 1st of January. Therefore, they have not been considered in prong two, but will be included 
as part of the transformational reforms moving forward, and you see the list there. So turning first of all to agency boards and commissions and its review. First of all, we fully recognize there's all sorts of small and medium deficiencies that our review have identified. We need to get to it. We will in 21 and 22, but that is not the focus now. And in fact, the Ernst & Young report that I'll speak about later strongly recommends that we don't focus on the small stuff. We focus on the big stuff. The big stuff in terms of the regional facilities is shown here. These are the financial contributions that we are providing currently to the, the, to the five regional facilities. The numbers in black are St. John's contributions. Then you add on to that um, an additional 33% that is provided th from the region. In short, we provide $2.4 million in operating deficit subsidies to our regional facilities. It is simply too much money. We are working through the process now uh, in, in order to address that. And we are also addressing the transit and parking commissions uh, for the same reason in that there is a significant operating subsidy and debt subsidy to that, those commissions. Let's turn to transit first and talk about uh, that particular review. We have commissioned an external organization known as Stantec to conduct a fundamental review. The purposes of that review are shown on this slide, but in essence, it's a question of addressing the most efficient and effective manner of delivering the service. Over on the right-hand side of this slide, you see some of the aspects that are being looked at during the review. Right now, uh, we are on track. We have been slowed slightly by COVID-19, but the intent is still to have a final report in the August timeframe of this year. That will permit us some four months or so to implement the key recommendations from that report. In terms of deliverables, you see here some additional words. Basically, it's savings through efficiencies and effectiveness through innovation. The, uh, the informed decision-making, uh, Stantec has been tasked to ensure stakeholder input and robust data analysis before making any recommendations. When we first began the transit review, the initial demand was to explore opportunities to cost avoid up to $2 million. That has since been adjusted as I've shown you on previous slides to cost avoid $750,000. And we do believe that a good chunk of that can be achieved through workforce adjustments. Because they are also on the standby list, however, we need recommendations for another, an additional 250,000 if required. We are also exploring at this time the possibility of moving away from the model where we have commissions for transit and parking and returning those two functions to under City Hall. We do believe that there are efficiencies and enhanced effectiveness can, that can be achieved through that. We are in discussions at this time However, it's fair to characterize that the Transit Commission is generally supportive. There are some major issues that are still being worked through, probably the, the most significant being pen, the, the pension implications of merging transit back under uh, City Hall. And a staff report will be provided to Council for a decision on 4 May. Turning to the structural reviews. The initial focus of the structure, sorry, of the structural review was only on the operational entity, uh, sorry, only on the staff, not the operational entities. That focus remains today. In other words, the current structural review does not address a review of, for example, our outside workers. It's also fair to say that the initial focus may have been on effectiveness. But now, based on our financial situation, the focus is more on finding efficiencies while enhancing effectiveness where possible. In other words, as shown in the quote, find savings in positions because we must while addressing some critical gaps. 
The review has also allowed us to do some housekeeping. And for example, casual positions that have been casual for literally a decade or more, one really needs to question why they're still being designated as casual positions. And therefore, we did some house cleaning in that regard. And what I'm about to show to you is the overall approach and decisions. But what needs to follow at this point is a detailed implementation plan. And we do have a project lead for this, and that's our director of human resources. During the detailed implementation planning, I have no doubt that there will be minor amendments to the organization that I am about to show you. Turning to the organization, throughout the discussions, we are focused on our staff model, which is to grow the city, serve the city, and become the community of choice. And clearly, the board of directors for everything that we do, if I can use that term, is common council. Looking at the first part of the organization that we will be moving to, we continue to retain a common clerk and the necessary legislative functions associated with that, including information management. And we continue to retain a city solicitor, or if you will, legal counsel function, but we are going to broaden the roles of that office to include a more robust capability to do contract review and monitoring and compliance. We do believe that there is money to be saved in terms of our contract monitoring, contract compliance, and also rolled in under this notion of a general counsel office will be everything that we do in terms of real estate. I will be briefing you on a proposed regional economic development model that will see a singular chief economic development officer, not part of the city staff, but reporting into, or certainly coordinating with, the city manager's office. Below the level of city manager, we have the commissioner level. The first commissioner in the new model is commissioner of growth and community services, as opposed to just growth and community development. The reason we have changed it to services is that this commissioner takes on some additional roles, such as recreational programming. This is not maintenance of our parks but the, and facilities, but this is determining what recreational activities should occur within those facilities. And this commissioner will also oversee the city market moving forward. The next commissioner has been re, uh, renamed again as Commissioner of Transportation and Public Works. The reason we have done this and the reason we have moved things such as recreation programming out of this particular organization is that this is where we see transit and parking residing should council decide to move it into uh, the city hall structure. So the first two there, transit and parking, are still to be confirmed. Uh, and then you see the remainder of the facilities, which are uh, the remainder of the functions, which are primarily public works and a singular fleet maintenance organization for the entire city, including transit, again, if we bring transit under City Hall. Next, we have the Commissioner of Public Safety and Fire Chief. Uh, this is the Fire Chief's role right now, but it's a recognition of the importance of public safety, and certainly COVID-19 pandemic is another example of that, in addition to the floods, in addition to the major fire responses that we have had to have in recent years. And therefore the Commissioner of Public Safety will not only oversee fire response, but all emergency management. Next, we have the Commissioner of Utilities and Infrastructure. This is our old Commissioner of Water. Now we'll, take on, we'll continue to maintain the role for water and wastewater, but we'll also take a centralized approach to everything to do with infrastructure and infrastructure management, including climate change and including a centralized engineering function. We will then have a chief of staff and chief financial officer, a double-hatted position, one person doing this, who will first of all look after all of what we would view as traditional financial services with one significant addition. We are developing an internal audit capability so that every time we want to check out how we're doing, we do not need to go running to an external firm to do this. Most organizations our size have some form of internal audit capability. Those are the functions that you would see this individual doing as the chief financial officer. As the chief of staff, 
they will oversee our human resources and our human resources is being elevated to commissioner level to drive home the point of the importance of effectively managing our workforce. We have a director of strategic affairs, which has been previously briefed, that will look after intergovernment relations, strategy development. So if I go back to that 10-year vision and strategy document, this is the individual who would lead that effort. And because of the individual we are placing in there, Mr. Ian Fogan, he will retain our risk management and, if you will, our insurance roles and capabilities within the organization. Next, we have a very long title and we'll attempt to shorten it, but we're talking about a director level position that looks at innovation, at customer service, and satisfies the IT portions of a chief information officer. Under that, we are creating a new integrated customer service center. If you will, it is the one-stop shop on steroids where in a one-stop shop concept, any city service, any question, any observation, will be managed through a singular customer service center. And finally, we have our communications managers who deal with our absolutely vital messaging, both internal and external. To complement this and to show how it fits within council, clearly the relationship between city manager and council has, is, does not change. We are, however, recommending that we go from two subcommittees of council growth and finance, to four in this model. We retain the growth and finance committees. We add in a public safety committee because there are all sorts of issues that we should be looking at moving forward once we get out of the sustainability morass in terms of public safety. And as a condition of bringing transit and parking into the city hall to ensure that transit and active transportation receive an appropriate profile in terms of common council deliberations and decisions, we are recommending a committee of council known as the Transit and Active Transportation Committee. What the new structure achieves, there's a very long list here, but despite the fact that the structure focuses on reducing the total number of people, I think it's fair to characterize that we have managed to address significant areas for improvement uh, with this new structure. I will not, in the interest of time, I will not go through this, but happy to deal with any questions that may be required. What does this save us, since this was an efficiencies exercise? If you take a look at our current structure and where we are going to end up, if I draw your attention to the first table up here in black, we will save a total of about five and a half full-time equivalents on the managerial side, and when you actually go through and count it line by line in terms of the managers that are left, we will save ourselves approximately uh, $912,000. On the inside worker side, we'll go from 110 positions, uh, saving ourselves approximately nine full-time equivalents. And again, going line by line, we are estimating that we will save $826,000. Both of these values fall in line with the minimum that we expect those two groups to address in terms of uh, their contribution to the workforce adjustments. Down below here are simply the additional details on these figures. And I would simply make the point that we're, we are not just calculating salaries, we're calculating salaries, our fringe benefits, and our special, pen, special pension payments when we make, these, we make these calculations. That's it for the structural review. Uh, moving on to regional facilities, the full, just quickly talking about each regional facility in turn, uh, Trade and Convention Center, we've done an external audit of the center. There are significant findings, and we are currently exploring the options. Imperial Theater, we asked them to provide us an impact statement on modest to complete reductions in subsidies. We have that information. The analysis is ongoing. For TD Station, the expressions of interest process is complete. We are now into confidential direct negotiations. Uh, and same with the Aquatic Center. And for the Arts Center, uh, we are in the early stages of figuring out what we could do there, if anything. 
Bottom line is, based on what I know of these various regional facilities, where we stand in the process and what the possibilities are, I do believe that it is reasonable to assume that we could save approximately $1.2 million or approximately 50% of our total contributions while still maintaining all of our regional facilities. There's a lot of work to be done for sure to get there from here, but I think it is achievable. The secondary benefit to this is the outlying municipalities would also in turn have to pay less. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19 and because of the level of negotiations required to work through some of this, I cannot at this point in time provide you the details, nor can I provide you a realistic timeline as to when these savings would occur. And that's the update on regional facilities. Turning to economic development, a concept paper was de developed and unanimously supported by the Economic Development Strategic Advisory Council that we created one year and three months ago. The Economic Development Strategic Advisory Council was a group of volunteers who had an interest in looking at economic development at a strategic level moving forward. The concept paper that was developed spoke about the notion of having a singular economic development agency, one vision, one board, one CEO, one budget, all the functions, including tourism, a regional focus, not just the city of St. John focus, but recognizing the, Saint, the city of St. John would be the anchor of the organization. If the concept paper were to be implemented, we would be the second largest, or we would have the second largest economic development agency in all of Atlantic Canada, and we would be the only economic development agency that incorporated all the functions, including tourism and population growth. This is receiving tremendous support from academia and the business community in terms of the potential to significantly propel growth within the region. What's next is we need regional support and approval for the implementation and the funding. The awareness and consensus building is ongoing through a third party contractual arrangement, contractors that we have hired to work through all the issues. So far, there has been an optimistic response from the municipalities, but the two key points, cost sharing and overall governance are still unresolved. I do not wish to mischaracterize this. I'm not saying they are not resolvable. They just have not yet been resolved at this point in time. We believe that we require decisions from council and support from the government of New Brunswick for LSD participation by the end of May. If we do not get that support from all the councils by that time, we will have to take a look at an alternate solution because our current solution is not supported by, by you as council for moving forward. Next, and I am getting close to the end, I want to talk very quickly about the operational audit. By way of background, Ernst & Young was awarded the contract. Really, there are three parts, a benchmarking exercise, identifying key challenges, and providing recommendations on operational facility efficiencies. You see the timeline here. That's a minor slippage from the initial timeline, but I do wish to commend Ernst & Young for going through a very complicated situation and for all intent and purpose, respecting the timings that we needed. The province and the city have been fully engaged in the feedback process to Ernst & Young, and quite frankly, they could not have written the report they wrote without that feedback. I do want to, again, under recognition of the staff, recognize that this was a significant undertaking by city staff. As soon as we talk about a third-party audit, there is a perception that the audit company goes away and does all their work and then simply comes back with a report. That is not at all the case. The city staff was heavily involved in data collection and validation obligations throughout the process. Overall, the city sta staff is substanti substantially supportive of the audit report. In other words, we believe, and we will be providing a recommendation to council that you endorse the report. The heavy lifting will be in terms of the, an implementation plan for that report there afterwards. And finally, in terms of an introduction, uh, a sincere thanks to the effort and the detail and the professionalism that was displayed by Ernst & Young throughout this process. The overall results, and I'll just build this slide, none of these would be surprising. 
but I would simply stress that um, there no, wasn't a whole lot new to the city. Um, uh, and we were pleased that Ernst & Young chose to recognize the significant gains that the city has already obtained and our um, long-term financial planning that is currently in place. Ernst & Young does speak quite extensively about how um, this is not going to be easy, that some tough decisions will be required because they will be foundational changes as we move forward. They have developed 11 different business cases. Most have recommendations associated with the longer term. I am not in the interest of time this evening going to go through the 11 business cases. The Ernst & Young final report is included within the publicly available information. Uh, is 107 pages long, but it does have an executive summary. What I have included on this slide is the potential opportunities should everything that is in that report materialize. And therefore you can see that it will be well worth our effort to put some time and consideration into their various recommendations as we move forward from here. But again, a cautionary note, those values would not materialize for several years because of the nature of the work that would need to be required. There are, there are 11 business cases focused in three particular areas. First of all, debt reduction, as shown here. They also talk about cost optimization, and I have included on this slide some examples of that. But again, a uh, cautionary tale, debt reduction uh, through selling of infrastructure only works if you have the market demand. Cost optimization will require further analysis. And then finally, revenue generation, and they spend quite some time talking about St. John Energy. The next steps for the operation, operational audit are, first of all, to prioritize all the work and to do a detailed analysis of all the recommendations. The staff must then develop an action plan for those recommendations and provide it to council for approval. One of the key things that they speak about is regardless of what measures are taken, there needs to be continued work on a shift in culture within the public service, and it applies to the city of St. John as well. And some of the phrases that I put in quote marks here uh, illustrate the sort of change and shift in culture that we are currently striving towards and certainly need to continue to put effort towards moving forward. Turning to St. John Energy, again, on which Ernst & Young uh, makes several comments and on which we have detailed, uh, a detailed audit from, audit from Deloitte as well. Uh, basically, when we talk about uh, the audit, the audit had two main objectives. First of all, to validate the growth agenda. That was a requirement of sustaining St. John, a three-part plan, and to determine the total value of, asset, of the asset that way Common Council can make informed decisions moving forward. The reports are complete as I showed you in my visual aid at the beginning of this uh, presentation. And there are in essence, three options. Uh, maintain the status quo in terms of rates and simply enable their growth agenda, sell the util utility or increase rates, flow that dividend towards the property tax re uh, reduction and also enable the growth agenda if you can. The point to all of these options is that option analysis and recommendation has not yet been completed. Talking very quickly about the three options, option one in terms of maintaining status quo rates but enabling the growth agenda, here's some interesting facts and figures. Right now, the residential and commercial benefit of having lower power rates than MB power equates to approximately $200 per household per year. There is, in that $7.4 million, no direct benefit to the city that every residential household has that reduction. However, the city itself does receive a $2 million benefit because its own power consumption is at a lower rate. The St. John growth agenda, validated by Deloitte, is estimated to bring in probably about $500,000 annually initially but could potentially grow to about $7 million 
over a 10 year period. And that would be $7 million annually. This risk agenda, of course, has risk inherent to it as any growth agenda would. You do not know for sure what the future market demand would be. And also of note, St. John Energy will need to borrow in order to fund capital projects and therefore cash flow will need to be carefully managed. The transfer of the growth agenda revenue, in other words, that dividend to the city, we believe may require legislative change. We are still trying to get a definitive answer on this one. But if it does require legislative change, it will be to a degree problematic because of comments we have already heard from provincial authorities. In terms of selling the utility, we did receive an unsolicited indicative bid from a proponent. Included in that bid was a notion of freezing the rates for three years and then accepting being a regulated industry with NB power rates there afterwards. We also had Deloitte evaluate what the uh, utility is actually worth. And very broadly speaking, without divulging values, we believe that this option, if you were to take the entire equity from the sale and put it into a locked in endowment that could only, where only the dividend could be used annually, we believe that we could achieve a two to $5 million annual contribution to the city. For this option, there would be no legislative change required. Finally, option three is to adopt the MB power rates, transfer that dividend to the city and enable the growth agenda. Again, what you would lose is that $7.4 million residential benefit or $200 per household. Our government in New Brunswick has already said they would be supportive of this option. Well, if it, for this option to make any sort of sense whatsoever, uh, a large part of that would have to go directly to a property tax decrease so that for the average residential household, it's a zero sum gain. They may lose the $200 in uh, the utility benefit, but they would gain $200 benefit in terms of lower property tax. But then we would need to deal with the lower income uh, families who do not own property and therefore don't benefit from any property tax reduction. More analysis clearly on the benefit of lower utility rates versus lower property rates is required within this option. Bottom line is, the next steps are we believe we need to establish a tax force to analyze these options and eventually provide recommendations to common council and government. We have been working in isolation, as has St. John Energy, as has NV Power, as have been our third party auditors. It's time to get the entire team together to debate all this and discuss it. And therefore, we are recommending that the task force composition be inclusive of everybody who has a vested interest or as a stakeholder in the future of St. John Energy. Turning to prong three, the transformational reforms. Comprehensive tax reform, property tax reform has been spoken at length. It is not just about industry paying more, it's about all of the questions that are shown here on this slide. Shown in red is a new issue that we wish addressed, and it's the notion of property value inversion. And I wanna show this slide to make the point. If you take a look at these two houses, they are very similar in design, size, and size of the lot. They are both raised bungalows. They both have detached garages and they are both of high quality and relatively new. Look at the property assessed value in Quispam Sis compared to that in St. John. In fact, and based and substantiated within a report that I'll speak about in a moment, we are probably the only city in Canada where we are seeing property value inversion. That is to say that properties in the center of the city are worth less than the ones further out. In any other city, whether you're talking about Ottawa, Kingston, Halifax, Moncton, Fredericton, or any other, the further out you go, the less expensive are the properties. In St. John, it is the exact opposite. And therefore we need that issue addressed within comprehensive tax reform. We need to address regional cost sharing. We do have 15 to 18,000 work commuters coming into the city daily. We have based on census data, 33,000 people who travel into the city daily. That places wear and tear on all of our infrastructure. 
30 to 35 percent of our users of our recreational facilities are non-residents, yet we subsidize all of those facilities. And we need to address regionalization of services. It makes very little sense that a region of 130,000 people has four or five of everything in terms of services. Next transformational reform is wage escalation control. We have the policy in place. We now need to make sure that that policy is applied to all collective agreements moving forward. And that will be a challenge, but one that must be done. And we have to address binding arbitration reform that we have spoken at length about. Uh, shown in blue is the key point. There is no intent whatsoever with the changes that are being recommended to binding arbitration to limit free and opening bargaining or to the, remove the right to binding arbitration. It is simply a case of including within the legislation that affordability to the municipality needs to be considered. And finally, in terms of transformational reforms, and I spoke about this in previous slides, we need to talk empo about empowerment of cities to generate their own revenues. Back to our wage escalation challenges for which we now have a wage escalation policy that must roll into our collective agreements and we need to address binding arbitration legislation. This is the increase in pay for our various work groups over the last 15 year period. And when you take a look and these are the cumulative pay raises, not just the sum of the pay raises for the 15 years, but the cumulative pay raises are significantly higher than this bottom line, which is the cost of living or CPI cumulative increase over the years. As we mentioned in our HR workforce report, the difference between this line and our actual lines over the last 15 years is approximately $100 million in additional costs. If we would have applied our wage escalation policy over the last 15 years, which is still somewhere in here above CPI, we would have saved $50 million in the last 15 years. Wage escalation is an issue that must be addressed through transformational reform. Sustaining St. John, a three-part plan, spoke about all of what I've already discussed, uh, but also identified the notion of a regional management task force to deal with two issues, regional cost sharing and regional services. The objectives and composition are shown on this slide. I will not go through it in detail, but I will highlight again that they were to be focused on regional cost sharing and a framework for service sharing right from their objectives within their original mandate. Their key deliverable was to provide the final report by March 31st. They clearly did not do that because of COVID-19 and other factors. Current status. We have had useful discussions to enhance each other's understandings and improve our regional awareness. We have, however, only had six meetings since September of 2019, one of which was a day-long workshop in Fredericton, not directly related to the regional issues. We have, and I, I show it in red only to highlight it, but not, not, not in any way to be derogatory, but the reality is we have no concrete recommendations at this time on regional cost sharing, nor do we have any concrete recommendations on shared regional services. The next step was to be a provincial reassessment in March of 2020 on these issues. Clearly that has not happened because of the delays caused by COVID-19. What has happened, however, is as part of the regional management task force work, the province supported by the city commissioned a third party audit firm known as Gardner Pinfold to do two studies, one on regional cost sharing and one on a heavy industrial analysis. The reasons for that are many, but one of the things that needed to be addressed through these reports is the city of St. John's assertion that there are associated costs borne by the city to be a regional hub and to have the heavy industrial footprint that we have. The challenge, however, is although we have made that assertion for many, many years, we have never actually been able to put a dollar figure on that cost. We as a city staff did some analysis on that last spring 
and came up with a figure of somewhere between six to $12 million. But it was a rudimentary analysis, and we certainly did not look at the cost of hosting heavy industry in the town. There's also the regional perception, shared by some, not all, that the city of St. John is simply mismanaged and wastes money. Therefore, the question becomes, how does the city benchmark against others in this regard? So the third party regional analysis was commissioned by the province. And as I said, they produced two reports as shown on this slide. Turning to the first report, cost of regional hub. I've already mentioned the key factors, the 15 to 18,000 work commuters, the 33,000 people per day, the wear and tear on the roads, uh, the increased fire and police required to maintain or to satisfy the demands of that increased population on a daily basis, and some increase to solid wage management, although it's not a significant number. And also the fact that 30 to 35% of all users of our recreational facilities are non-residents. So the first report, first of all, looked at benchmarking data. And this is a quote from the report, basically saying, for those who cannot read it because of uh, our connectivity this evening, that our parks costs are lowest within the group of benchmarking cities, recreation somewhere in the middle, police costs in the middle, and fire services costs are the highest. Uh, for cost of paved lane rank, load, laneway or roads, we're somewhere in the middle, and winter storm management, we're somewhere in the middle. Put simply, we're not really out of whack with everybody else. However, they offer a caution, and again, I showed in red simply to emphasize it, that uh, the results need to be taken with a grain of salt, because there's no guarantee that, are, that, they, are being, that they are comparing apples to apples. For example, when we talk about paved laneway or road costs, does every municipality that provided uh, facts and figures on this include depreciation of their equipment, uh, include uh, the, not only the salaries of the employees, but their fringe and benefit costs, et cetera, et cetera. So again, an air of caution. The key conclusions out of the benchmark marking data, however, is that we are relatively well aligned with other communities. And overall, there cannot be a conclusion that we are mismanaging our expenditures. However, the benchmarking data is useful in that it does highlight a few areas where perhaps more in-depth analysis is required, and certainly Ernst & Young Operational Audit had the same observation. In terms of the costs, and again, the purpose of the audit was not only to do the benchmarking data, but also to identify what the costs are as a regional hub. Here, shown here is their assessment that it costs the city $12.3 million annually to be a regional hub. And again, the details are in the report, which is included within all the information that is being provided today. There is also, but not included in the $12.3 million, a recognition that in terms of economic development, the city has paid over 90% of all the economic development costs over the past decade, yet for every 100 jobs that we create within the city, approximately 40 of those jobs, the individuals reside outside of the city. And we have in fact seen growth rates in the outlying areas that consistently outperform the growth rate in the city, yet we're paying for most of the economic development costs. Therefore, the staff recommendations on the gardner Pinfold report and the corresponding input into the Regional Management Task Force into the province is that we do recognize and generally agree with the $12 million of costs incurred. We do, however, recognize that some of the calculations can be deba debated and therefore there is some scope for reductions. Therefore, we are recommending that the province impose a cost recovery system that's phased in over two years whereby in the first year, the region cost recovers to the city of St. John, six million of that $12 million annual cost. In the second year, that gets ramped up to $8 million of the $12 million in annual costs. We then believe that the province should re-examine and recalculate, if you will, the total costs incurred and come up with the necessary adjustments for 2023 and beyond. To achieve a recovery of six to $8 million, we believe that there are only two 
realistic options. One is to put a levy on everybody's tax bills, known as the St. John Regional Levy, to capture and collect those costs. And the other would be to put a significant system of tolls on the roads. The big point in terms of this cost recovery and a recommendation from the staff is that if cost sharing were to be implemented as described above, then we would further recommend that moving forward, the city no longer insists on regional fees paid to the city, for example, for the regional facilities, and that there would be no differential rates or non-resident users fees imposed by the city moving forward. In short, all of those items that cause great aggravation and friction within the region and animosity and debate and um, an unhealthy attitude could disappear if once and for all we address the issue of regional cost sharing. Turning to the two options we propose, I won't spend a lot of time on tolls on roads. First of all, we would not do it all the time. We'd only do it for certain periods of the day. We'd only do it on traffic coming in. We would keep the toll modest at approximately $2 per use. The challenge with this model is if you want to keep the toll modest, you still have all the capital costs associated with tolls. So really the upper end limit of what we could recover is 4 to $5 million, which is short of what we believe uh, needs to be adjusted in terms of regional cost sharing. But the advantage to tolls is that only those who actually use city facilities would be uh, billed for them. And if you keep it limited in scope, it would not affect those who are coming in to use regional facilities, hospitals or other commercial businesses. The more practical approach to avoid needless capital costs uh, and needless continual billing of $2 at a shot is to simply recognize a St. John levy. Here's the data on how many households. The bottom line is to recover $6 million Households outside of the city of St. John would have to pay $265 on average annually. To go up to $8 million in the second year, it's $353 annually, which is slightly less than a dollar a day. And of course, all sorts of options are possible in terms of prorating this based on property assessments, should the province wish to do so. Turning to the second report on heavy industrial, Again, Gardner Pinfold was asked to identify the costs associated with us hosting the heavy industrial base. To be clear, and it is identified within the report as well, the city, its residents, and its other businesses benefit greatly from having heavy industry in the city. However, the city budget does not benefit greatly. It benefits to a limited degree. How so? Well, first of all, we have this property inversion that I've shown you before. Gardner Pinfold has taken a look at this, and I draw your attention to the last bullet. If there was not that property inversion, if we were like every other city, we would have in the area of $32 million a year more in property tax just from the value of our residential and commercial properties in the city other than the heavy industry. Then there is also uh, additional fire emergency response for heavy industry and maintenance and wear and tear on our roads. The total is approximately $35 million. Of note right now, in terms of the property tax we do collect from ind heavy industry, we collect approximately $12 million a year. Not all of that is supposed to be going towards heavy offsetting heavy industry costs. Some of that is supposed to be going towards community good as it does with all other commercial enterprises. Therefore, our recommendations are, first of all, we need to continue to vigorously pursue comprehensive property tax reform. Secondly, in the interim, we still believe, as we have suggested before to the province, that the property tax that they collect from heavy industry and only from heavy industry be immediately transferred to the city because we have undebatable quantifiable data that shows that we are out of pocket significantly more than what that transfer would be. The transfer would be approximately $8 million a year. We are further suggesting 
that it be a trial only in place until comprehensive tax reform kicks in. And as a trial, we would commit to using it to spur growth by taking every penny of this transfer and using it to reduce our property tax. To conclude, words I'm sure that everybody is happy to hear. We believe through prong two, we have solved the deficit of 2021 and 2022 through $5 million in workforce adjustments that are not yet in place, but can be in place by the end of the year, through $5 million in planned initiatives and a standby list of close to $2 million. By doing that, we believe that we have addressed the $10 million challenge and that we will achieve balanced budgets in 21 and 22. There's still outstanding work that needs to be done. First of all, on the city's to-do list, we still need to address regional facilities and our aspirational target of reducing that by 1.2 million. We believe by going through a regional economic development model, we can certainly in the short, short term achieve some $200,000 in annual savings. On the provinces to-do list, we believe that they will need to show leadership and impose, if you will, a regional cost sharing formula that sees us receiving six to $8 million annually and we also wish them to continue to consider the possibility of a trial of the heavy industrial property tax transfer to the city to be used to reduce property tax rates. Combined city and province together, we need to address the potential that exists within St. John Energy, although there's still a tremendous amount of work and analysis to occur there. And we also need to begin the plan to address the potential within the Ernst & Young operational audit. All of that combined would see us yielding approximately 15 to $20 million in additional provincial, in additional revenue if the province were willing to act now. This is an interesting slide. It's a hypothetical slide where I asked the question, let's pick the middle of that range between 15 and 20. What could we do with $17 million of additional revenue? First of all, uh, that should read every, sorry, not Everett. Every $670,000 is a penny reduction on the tax rate. So in option one, what could we do with the 17 million? We could reduce the tax rate by about 24 cents. That would put us 10 cents lower than Moncton, but still about 10 cents higher than Fredericton and still about 20 to 30 cents higher than the regional towns. In option two, we could match the Moncton tax rate. So at least we no longer have the reputation of being the highest. And we could have a sustainment focus, that is to say, $9 million would go towards lowering the tax rate by about 13 cents. And then the other $8 million could be used to dramatically reduce what we borrow every year for capital projects. And in fact, we could start considering all sorts of neat and interesting things that we can't afford now, but perhaps could afford in the future, such as incentive funds to encourage business growth or other such ideas. Of course, all of that is hypothetical until the transformational reforms of the previous slide are implemented. Turning to the next steps, therefore, tomorrow morning, because this, of course, is a ton of information, we have scheduled a media briefing for the mayor and the city manager, whereby we will deal with questions that the media may have based on everything that has been presented this evening and what is available on our website at this time. Uh, we will then uh, work with the province to have a regional caucus as soon as possible to discuss all of the points and see where they are in terms of the regional management task force, regional cost sharing, and heavy industrial uh, tax transfer. We will then enter into a period of two weeks of public discussion. During that public discussion, we will be encouraging the public to speak to their counselors and offer their comments, questions, and observations. We have also created a special email address known as feedback at stjohn.ca, whereby members who do not wish to speak to their counselors, would prefer simply sending an email, can do so at that address. And also there will be a link on our web, web page to achieve the same result. And then finally, on the 4th of May, we would return to council with multiple recommendations, some of which you've seen in this slide deck. There will be many more to enable the overall plan and the future staff action that is required to implement that plan. 
Therefore, in conclusion, we know we have to balance the budget in 21 and 22. Right now, the forecast is $10 million. We will achieve that through 50% workforce adjustments, 50% initiatives and continuous improvement initiatives, and a standby initiatives for the unforeseen. Thereafterwards, we must control our costs. We will do so through all of the various items shown here. We then must increase our revenues, otherwise more cuts will be coming, and we do so through the items shown here. And then we must spur growth, and we do so through all of these items that I have touched on. In short, we have a plan, and it's time to implement it. In conclusion, we believe that we've taken a thoughtful and strategic approach to, to address our challenges. We have gone through an all options on the table approach to address the immediate deficit. We have been working with the province on transformational reforms and the dialogue has been positive. Uh, we have a long-term vision to create the opportunities for growth and the quality of life in St. John. And we have solved the $10 million immediate challenge. We have not yet solved the structural deficit or assured our financial future. We have a plan, but those transformational reforms must occur. The city, quite frankly, has done its job. We've done our bit to get onto the right path. It is now the province's turn to take that leadership role for the next few steps. As the background of this slide shows, with all of the above, the future is indeed bright. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Our recommendation for this evening is simply a receive and file to allow that public discourse and the preparation of a full suite of applicable recommendations. Members of council, uh, I apologize for the length of this briefing this evening. However, it was important to get all of that out and on the table for due consideration over the next couple of weeks so that we can enable a plan before the end of May. I will stop sharing my screen at this point, Your Worship. Hopefully there are still people at the other end. Uh, subject to your questions and comments. Okay, thank you very much, City Manager. That was uh, an extensive um, uh, presentation tonight. I'm sure there are some comments. Just as a reminder for all of us, it's uh, it's a uh, we certainly should ask some questions tonight. And as the City Manager said, it's a receiving file only, and uh, and another full meeting on May the fourth. So uh, uh, I'm going to go to our our um, our uh, finance chair. I think you had your hand up first. Uh, I'll go to you, Councillor Merrithew. Yep, I see thank you. you uh, thank you, uh, City Manager. And, and a ton of information there. A ton of information. I just want to concentrate, first of all, on the Gardner Penfold uh, report and the EY uh, uh, audit uh, to make sure that they, and I, I this is the first I've heard about the um, you and the mayor will be in front of uh, uh, media tomorrow morning. So that, that's a good thing. This this thing has to go public. I realize those two documents are are long in nature, but to highlight, they, they recognize first that uh, the city in the last three years has done a good job. Staff has done a great job and that there's been no mismanagement here. They also recognize that the, what we've been talking about for three years, regional co cooperation, cost sharing, uh, uh, our cost problems through arbitration and minimum manning, our revenue problems, whether they be outlying areas or, or an industry, fair taxation, the wear and tear on our assets. They recognize all of that in this doc and those two documents, excuse me. And at the end of the day, there are tens of millions of dollars uh, that if we could resolve some of those issues seems to be very close at hand, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. So we'll debate this a lot more. I know it's getting late. There's others that want to speak, so I'll leave it at that. But um, please make sure the public gets a hold of this. The MLAs get a copy of this. I'm sure the Premier's seen it. Other uh, other uh, leaders and in, 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 in municipalities close to us, Let don't set it on the shelf for God's sake, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Your Worship, the only comment I'll make on that is all of the information is now on the website. It was posted this evening. 
So the main slide deck and all of the references are there for public consumption at this point in time. There will also be, first thing tomorrow morning, some summary media products that will also be uh, distributed uh, because let's face it, there's a lot of material there and some summary sheets would be helpful to certain individuals. So all that is happening. John, that's wonderful, summary sheets. But if they wanted that, I think the uh, Ian Wire uh, audit was like 117 pages. If they wanted it, I want to make sure they can get it, please. It is on the website now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hickey, you're up. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll keep my comments brief and save most of it for our next meeting. Um, and in the interest of time, I just want to uh, certainly reiterate from Councillor Merrithew, I have a great deal of confidence in this vision. I have a great deal of confidence in this plan. Um, and I think we're setting up the city for tremendous success. I would say in echoing what the city manager has said, certainly the missing link for me or the weakest part of our chain is that third prong. Um, and I hope that these transformational changes uh, that the province needs to uphold uh, and the region as a whole needs to uphold, uh, stand together and certainly recognize the potential for shared success as a region. Um, I'm excited about uh, the Regional Economic Development Agency. I'm excited about the idea of having a, a transit and active transportation uh, commission. Uh, but beyond that, the biggest thing for me is in the regional aspect of the report, I hope what we take from this is uh, an ability to no longer split hairs uh, as a region and no longer differ on these issues as a region, but instead to align and to move forward together on a regional cost sharing model that makes sense for the city, that makes sense for the uh, region as a whole and allows us to grow as a region of, as a whole. So I, I, that's certainly the link I see missing. Uh, hopefully, hopefully the province and the region uh, picks up on that and uh, we can move forward. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, head Councillor Reardon next, please. Thank you, Worship. I just want to really say thank you to John and to the whole team that worked on this. It's a top shelf presentation. It's fantastic. It answers so many of our questions. It's done by the third party. I mean, you can't argue that. It's not biased. So, you know, it really gives us the foundation that we require to go forward, I think. And it's it it's so transparent. So I'm so pleased with it. I'm, in fact, my phone, I'm getting all these little texts from people that are saying, you know, this gives us so much hope. What a great job. What a great presentation. You know, so everything, all the components are there in coming together. So it's been, I know it's been a lot of work. And uh, before John started, when he was just going through all the booklets there and all the trees they've killed, just getting these reports out, it's just amazing, fantastic. So I want to make sure I, I say uh, I'm so grateful for uh, for his leadership on this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy, I had you your hand next, I think. You're, mu you're muted, Deputy. Thank you, Worship. <laughs> I have no idea what that was. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, do you by chance have the YouTube feed going on or something else uh, with the speaker on in your area? No. no. That blue button is on. Maybe that, Maybe I that, took that off. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to you, Deputy. Maybe you could just mute for a minute. You, you've got can I suggest you, when you come back, Deputy, if you turn your volume completely down on your speaker, that might help. Okay, we'll come back to you, Deputy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, I had you next. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, look, uh, first, I want to thank everybody that's been involved in this. Uh, John, you and your team, uh, all of the commissioners and other staff members. This has been one heck of a long haul. You know, it's been hired on staff, it's been hired on council. You know, now we have restructure in place that I think, you know, we've been looking forward to for a couple of years now. And we've got this third party uh, consultants report from Gardner Pinfold to let people know that, look, your city's as good as any. 
you know. Uh, they're not uh, lagging behind. We're, we're right in there with the other cities. Uh, we can start looking at this and say, hey, you know, we're doing a good job here. And we're going to do a better job. And I think that, it, yes, it's going to be tough in 21 and 22. Uh, but we're capable of, of doing that. We've shown this uh, budget. We, we know that we're good, we can get the revenue generated and we know we can make the cuts needed. But at the end of the day, we're as good as any and better than most. And uh, I'm glad to have that uh, that analysis on the city done by a third party to, uh, to start, you know, turning things around here in terms of, you know, the way people think about the city of St. John. And to understand that it does cost the city taxpayers in St. John a lot of money to be an industrial hub. And I think now people will see that. So I'm going to I'm going to keep my comments short here because of the time of night, but I just had to get that out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Strawbridge. We'll try you, and then thank you. Um, I too just want to say very quickly uh, thank you to uh, everyone who worked on this. Uh, the countless hours, the reading of reports, putting it all together to present to a bunch of councillors. Uh, it goes without saying uh, my appreciation for the amount of work uh, that has gone into putting all of this together. So thank you to everyone involved. When I look over this, um, and uh, it, there's a lot of information and I think it's going to be very difficult to get it out to the public in a in a world where everybody scrolls and wants to get to the, uh, to, you know, to the climax in 10 seconds, they don't want to, you know, spend a whole lot of time. I think it's going to be very challenging uh, to get it. Well, I'm getting the same echo. But. I, I think it's the Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor, can you go on mute, please? Um, anyway, to get to my point, I look at some of these items that are being proposed and I have to question, how is that going to be tangible to the people every day uh, when we're talking about what that's going to mean in a practical sense uh, when we start implementing this? Because some of these items, most of the items on in this report, I can support. Some of them, as, it, uh, as I read them right now, I couldn't support because I haven't been briefed on exactly what they're going to mean. And so number 15, winter street maintenance. What exactly is that going to mean next winter when it's time to get trucks out on the roads and clearing snow? So give me, I'll give you an example. Are priority four streets now going to wait twice as long to get service as an example? Um, I need to know how that's going to look the next snowstorm for people. Can someone please brief me on that? Because I don't know. Uh, you, your Worship, if I may, to the councillor, um, we would be, uh, first of all, as an offer, we would be certainly willing to sit down with any councillor to talk about any concerns with any of the sustainability items. And the team led by Stephanie Rackley Roach is on standby to do that. Uh, I would also, however, draw to the attention of all councillors that as part of the deck that was provided to you, and what is available to the public as well uh, is, I think it's tabs uh, Charlie and Delta, tab C and tab D, that are fact sheets. Uh, the name probably isn't, isn't reflective of what they actually are, but they are one or two page documents that talk about each of those sustainability initiatives, provide a bit more detail, and do talk about the impacts uh, in terms of the service levels and the communities. To answer your specific question about snow removal, that's in the fact sheets and we can provide you more detail, but no, there will be no significant decrease in service levels for snow removal because of this proposal. In fact, one could argue that depending on when the snow falls, the, the service levels might increase, but there's more detail on that in the fact sheets. And again, Councillor, we'd be more than happy to answer any specific questions you have over the next couple of weeks as you deliberate all of these various initiatives. That's what the staff is here for. Okay, I'll take you up on that offer and I'll just stop now. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Can you go on mute and we'll try the deputy again? Thank you, deputy. Hi. Hi. I don't know. Uh, uh, I can. Anyway, it has a thing up here saying mute. Perhaps. There. Okay. Yeah, Deputy, the only thing I, I could suggest is to, in the bottom right-hand corner of your laptop, to make sure that your speaker volume is turned completely down and then try again. You're getting some sort of feedback from a speaker in your house right now. Well, can well, you hear well, me? Uh, okay. I'll, I'll let it go. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. Maybe you can go on mute for a second. Thank you. Okay, um, anyone else for tonight? No? Okay, I uh, have a couple of comments then. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, as others have said, uh, just a tremendous amount of work. You know, uh, thank you, city manager, to all of our, our teams, to the provincial government, because we, I guess we can't forget that uh, uh, lots of folks in Fredericton have been working on these files as well. And I think it... Uh, I, you know, for me, as I reflect, I will have a series of uh, questions, city manager, uh, in a couple of weeks. We just had a massive amount of information presented to us tonight. But ultimately, for me, it's how do we translate uh, all of this great conversation into real action? And, and I, you know, we're just so full of potential, um, you know, we, for not only the city, but I truly think about the whole the whole region. So, so again, thank you for that. I, we've come a long way in 48 months. We've come a long way in the last 12, but we've come a long way as a, as a group uh, working together in the last 48 months. I'm very proud of that. Um, certainly for me, again, the lens that I'm looking through is how do we come together as a region economically, socially, and culturally to thrive? And there's never been a more important time uh, than, than now, especially in light of uh, everything that we're facing. We don't really know all of the impacts of that means change. Uh, but, but I think at the end of the day, it, we come out of the other side of this, I think, uh, even stronger. Uh, really pleased. Um, it really is going to call on Hampton, St. Martin's, Quispamsis, Rossi, ourselves, Grand Bay, Westfield, to come together in a way that I believe we can be the strongest economic region, one of, in all of Atlantic Canada. And, you know, certainly the province needs us to recover. We're almost 25% of GDP or the economy, and the province needs us to recover. Um, I think we need to just update our lens because, you know, we've done a lot of work and then this thing called coronavirus hit us. And uh, we just make sure over the next week or two, folks, that we think about uh, the, the, also the lens of uh, uh, growth and how important that's going to be, you know, as we debate whether we should cut out uh, the growth reserve and before the city manager jumps back in and says, well, if we don't, if we don't accept one of the line items, we have to find another line item to drive by. Certainly get that city manager. Thank you. Uh, the EY report. Uh, the Ernst & Young report, um, uh, to your point, uh, uh, um, Councillor Merrithew, and the Gardner Pinfold, these are incredible reports that really shine an awful lot of light on uh, exactly where we are, what we've done, and, and, and the opportunities that, that lie before us. I think we need to, um, I, I think to some of your comments, Councillor Strobridge, for me, the answer is we decide what are the measurements, financial, economic, social, and quality of life that would position the city and the region to be successful. And then I don't, I don't know all of those yet. I certainly have some ideas. Uh, and and oh, as we move forward, those that would be the lens in which uh, we measure our success. So um, I guess I'll end with... A couple of last bullets. First of all, I think the again a thank you to the province because my understanding, city manager, is of course we worked hand in hand. 
but they commissioned and paid for the Gardner Pinfold reports and the Ernst and Young report. And I think that's a good thing because some of you reference this as well. It's important because it validates that council and staff have been what we've been saying for years. It's a third party validation uh, that there is tremendous opportunity and that uh, a lot of what we've been talking about, and certainly I'll say this as a mayor from day one, saying that we need a new approach or a new deal and uh, that I, I truly believe there's opportunity as we come together, but we have to come at it differently. And I think these reports absolutely validate that uh, tonight. So I'm really thrilled with that. Almost done. Uh, I think tonight's presentation, as I said, is, is a result of many months of difficult and detailed work uh, by many, and I, I'm thankful. Thank you, city manager and staff for the tremendous work on the sustainability presentation. Thank you in particular to the commissioner of finance and his team for, for providing the background materials so that we could receive accurate reports for Gardner Pinfold and Ernst and Young. Thank you to the province for taking this matter seriously and working to get these reports done. So now I say everyone, uh, let's get at it, enough talk. Uh, the city of St. John has done its part now and we need to seize this opportunity uh, to change the way we do business. We, we know what reforms we need and we know what changes we need. And now we have an accurate chap, snapshot, excuse me, of the costs. And we really owe it to the taxpayers to get this done. So I'll end with this. We must come together as a region to collaborate and reset our approach to thrive economically, socially, and culturally, and position our region to thrive uh, post-COVID-19. And here's my, here's my ask of every single citizen in this region, I, I, I say, inside St. John, embrace the change, hold us accountable so that we implement all of these reports Ernst and & Young, and, and, and all of the opportunities we have before us. To the 60,000 people outside of St. John, invest $1 a day in coming together so that we can thrive and grow. And, and I'm a believer that when we look back five years from now, it'll be the best dollar you've ever invested. So I hope you'll support your, you know, your provincial government and your councils and your mayors to see us come together and all get in the same boat and row in the same direction so we can uh, we can thrive. So uh, I'll have a lot more in two weeks, city manager, but uh, I'm feeling incredibly optimistic tonight and I'm calling on the provincial government to act and all of us to come together. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, so who would like to move this monumental? Yep, thank you. Uh, Councillor Marathew moved and... Uh, and uh, Councillor Sullivan just beat all the other hands to it just slightly, but we all have an opportunity to vote unanimously for this one tonight if we can. So I'll call the question, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. Anyone contrary-minded? I don't think that's a contrary-minded, so uh, unless I hear differently, that's a unanimous vote uh, tonight on that, on that matter. So, okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Common Clerk, if you're still with us, we'll call on uh, the next item. I'm here, Your Worship. Uh, next item is 13.1, and it's uh, from the Finance Committee. It's the 2020 Capital Budget Reallocations General and Utility Fund. Okay, thank you. And um, could, uh, uh, am I going to the Commissioner of Finance to you? Sorry, uh, Councillor Marathew as our Chair of Finance, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Our council has read the package. Um, there are a number of projects that were to be, we asked the uh, province of Brunswick to co-fund with us, and uh, they sent us a letter not too long ago declining some of those projects. Uh, we had money in the 2020 budget for, uh, for these projects, and what staff is looking to do is reallocate that money to other um, uh, capital projects. Um, so uh, this came before Finance Committee. And finance committee has uh, has recommended is recommending to uh, the council to, um, to to pass the recommendation. Uh, I will move it if someone seconds it. Okay. Can okay. You. Can you hear by, me? Yeah, one second. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Marathew, seconded by Councillor Reardon. 
and then deputy I think we, we've got some kind of funky uh, uh, rec recoil on for you you want to try again deputy no your worship if I may with the deputy mayor uh, deputy we believe that you are logged in twice to this meeting and that's why we're getting the feedback so okay. if I can ask you to just exit out of the meeting and rejoin it exit out completely and rejoin the feedback should disappear for you Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so we have the uh, motion on the floor. I'm not seeing any hands to speak on it, so I'll call that question. All those in favor? Thank you, and anyone contrary minded? Not seeing or hearing anyone? Okay, thank you. Next item, Common Clerk. Uh, your Worship, 15.1 on your agenda is a letter um, from the Office of the Premier with respect to conversion therapy. The re, uh, recommendation from staff is to receive this for information. Okay. Moved by Councillor Marathew, seconded by Councillor Hickey. Thank you to receive for information. Thank you. On the question, okay. uh, I'll call the question. Sorry, all those in favor? Anybody? Thank you. Uh, and anyone contrary minded? Not seeing any. Thank you. Next item. Uh, 15 2 on your agenda is a, a citizen letter from Mr. LeBlanc with respect to. Clearing virus, uh, clearing virus measures, and the recommendation is to receive for information. Okay, thank you. Moved by uh, Councillor Reardon, second by Councillor Sullivan. Thank you. On the question, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. And anyone okay. reminded? Not seeing any. Thank you. Motion's carried. Next item. Uh, 15 3, your worships, a letter from MLA Lowe with respect to the city's taxi bylaw. The staff recommendation is to receive for information. And there's a note here that staff report to council is under development and due back to council on May 4th. Okay, thank you. Uh, are you moving, Councillor Reardon, and second, Councillor Sullivan? Thank you. Okay, uh, and on the question? I have a question. Okay, thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Go ahead. Thank you. Can we? Are we able to do something tonight with this? If we, if I make a motion on what he's advised for the three months, does it have to? Is it a, a law question? Or can we make it happen tonight? With the, like especially the car that he asked for three extra months. Is that it? Maybe Jonathan, uh, city manager, uh, your worship. Um, I, I I would not recommend any um, d decisions this evening. Uh, we are still working through the analysis. I do believe that we will have some favorable uh, recommendations, favorable in terms of providing uh, some sort of consideration to the taxi industry within the city. But to do anything on the fly is, is always dangerous. We're talking Form A, which is still before any of the upcoming deadlines. Uh, and therefore, uh, we believe the timing will still work for the taxi industry at this point. So, no, I, I personally would not recommend any immediate motions this evening. But we will have something by the 4th of May? The, yes, we are coming to you with concrete recommendations on the 4th of May. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor McKenzie, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, John, would you be reaching out to uh, a couple of the operators uh, themselves to talk about you know, uh, your ideas and their ideas to see if you're on the same page, because there's a couple of things that I think that, you know, they may be able to uh, help you out with there. Uh, noted. I mean, we, we already have some recommendations from uh, individuals, including uh, MLA uh, Jerry Lowe. Uh, our lead person on this is Mr. Mark Dion, and he's on this call. He, uh, he notes your comments. And yes, we will engage as appropriate, but also as possible over the next week and a half. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And I, I certainly, um, I, I received a note from uh, somebody in the industry as well that had a whole series of uh, suggestions on how cost press pressures could be eased for uh, drivers as well. So I certainly will pass that along to you, city manager, and, and, uh, and share with council as well. Okay, uh, so the recommendation is on the floor, so I'll call that question. All those in favor? Thank you, and anyone contrary minded? Not seeing any. Okay, motion's carried, thank you. Next item, please, Common Clerk. Uh, Your Worship, 16.1 is the staff report that was uh, sent out today with respect to the WebEx agreement. And there's a staff recommendation in the report. Okay, 
Thank you. Your Worship, if I may, just by way of very quick introduction, because this is a very late Please. Uh, re report to Council, and our apologies for that, but working with the various vendors, uh, quite frankly, because of everything else that's going on with these vendors, uh, it took more time than we had hoped. Uh, bottom line is, we have become accustomed to WebEx. It works well for us in terms of enabling everything that we need to do within the virtual domain. Our trial license is about to expire and we must enter into a proper arrangement. For now, we only want to do it for one year as we explore alternative options. But certainly we are hopeful that council will approve this one year contract because for us to implement an alternative option midstream of a crisis like this would not be helpful to anybody. So we're asking for your tolerance and acceptance to accept this one year contract. And then we will be taking a look at a more permanent solution in the months to come. City manager, I'm sorry, I, I may have, you may have said it and I, but it's, it was a late addition, as you said, could you just outline at a high level? It's uh, it's, uh, it allows our whole operation to work. It's X number of seats and it's X yeah. number of dollars. It's uh, it's $18,000 for the year. It gives us the licenses we need in order to enable the necessary virtual meetings that we are all currently experiencing. That includes the staff meetings, council meetings, and also, and probably equally as important, all of the public hearings, et cetera, that we have planned for the future. So this will satisfy our needs for the year. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, do I have a mover and a second? Okay, moved by Councillor McKenzie, seconded by Councillor Hickey. Thank you. On the question, any comments, questions? Uh, okay, I'll call the question. Sorry, all those in favor? Thank you. Anyone contrary minded? Okay, uh, thank you very much. That motion is carried unanimously as well. And Councillor Sullivan, uh, five minutes to spare. I was worried we were going to have to do that procedural over 10 o'clock, so good for you. Okay, Common Clerk, that's it. Uh, there's one other item, Your Worship, right. from uh, Committee of the Whole. It's oh. item 17.1, and it's a resolution with respect to sustaining St. John transit and parking. Okay, thank you. Can uh, Could you just read the recommendation, please? For yes, us? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, it is recommended that Council approve in principle the intent and approach as described within the report. Uh, uh, the uh, sorry. May I interrupt? Um, we, we did commit earlier on that uh, all decisions related to sustainability would be decided on 4 May. So my apologies, this is a disconnect between myself and the common clerk uh, in that that motion is designed to be brought forward to council open session on 4 May with all the other motions uh, related to sustainability. Okay, great. So that so there's no more items for tonight. That would be, yeah, there's no need to pass that resolution. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Motion to adjourn then, Council? So moved. Second, thank you. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, second by Councillor Hickey. Uh, thank you, everybody. Once again, uh, uh, I think very productive meeting uh, for our second in history online session. Thank you to all the staff uh, for the tremendous amount of work uh, getting us here tonight. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Thank you. And anyone contrary minded? Thank you. Motion is carried. And uh, have a good evening, everybody.